Hello there, everybody. Welcome to episode one of the Intermission podcast, the highly original concept of a show where two film students discuss classic films, iconic films, and obscure films of all sorts that either one of us have seen, none of us have seen, or both of us have seen. I'll work on that at some point. Woo! But, but yeah, I yeah. am Oscar W. Fitchett. I'm Robbie Tweedale. And we are your two hosts for this podcast. And that is as formal as I'm going to probably get in this. So, <laughs> the con... <laughs> the initial- The basic premise of the podcast, as I just said there, is we are going to discuss, going to be discussing films at, I don't know when, I don't know how often this podcast will be, that will be further discussed. However, considering we are both film students, uh, and both big film film fans first, I like to think. Uh, You know what? I love the movies. (laughs) I love all the movies. Uh, short and long, if they're good. We'll talk about it. <laughs> Don't worry about Indeed. it. Indeed. And there's also a certain thing that's between us. If you haven't, if you're unfamiliar with us two generally, there's a six year age gap between the two of us, me yeah. being almost 25 and Robbie being 19 years of age. Yes. I And so I, I've i always been in, because went round about back when I was your age, Robbie. Mm-hmm. This was round about the time when I was starting to really get more into the more. Um, exp- uh, I was delving deeper into certain films. Okay. Uh, that time, so I thought, what would be an interesting premise would be almost to almost discuss films like that yeah. with you. And I know you, but the thing is, well. I know you have seen plenty of films anyway yes. as well. You're not... It's it's all I do. I was very surprised early on in university when I found out you've seen Breathless, and I haven't. Yeah. It's re- it's it's fine. That's fair. <laughs> Watch it if you want. I can't comment. I haven't seen it. However, yeah. there's also a lot of films which either you haven't seen or are still incredibly new to you. Yes that I thought would be an incredibly interesting thing to make this as a point of discussion for those things. Mm Because also, I love talking about films. Um, I I love watching them, I love talking about them, and I enjoy making them. And what I uh, like doing, I mean, there's many shows online, whether it be YouTube or podcast related, that discuss uh, the more uh, mainstream section of films there's a big um market for comic book film discussion star wars film discussion yeah, and um and to which i i like star wars and i like the more blockbuster mainstream stuff and you are definitely a fan of I, i'm a bigger fan of the marvel stuff than you i would yes. say i yes, will make definitely. you watch one of those for this i hope you're aware of that you 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 will make me watch one of yeah these. you will watch at least one of them that you haven't seen Ah, well, that would be a discussion. <laughs> the point, Robbie. <laughs> but I like the idea. But I, but I also thought, like, what would be a cool idea is. Could, but what I've realised, I enjoy watching certain uh, YouTube channels that are dedicated more to. It's going to sound a bit pretentious, but that's just going to be the th- uh, oh, prestige. So oh, pictures. Jesus. Uh, but obviously, like, I like watching a YouTube channel called Dicecape, uh, a guy called Dicecape Beppu who primarily talks about Criterion releases and he discusses the Criterion collection and I enjoy watching other channels that discuss not recent films and looking back almost retrospectively on certain films and discussing mm-hmm. it within that and when I used to review films quite regularly on YouTube the things that I enjoyed doing the most was doing retrospective and older films Like, uh, one of my favourite things I ever did on YouTube was when Gary and I reviewed the entire Bond franchise. And I enjoy enjoy looking back at stuff like that. So I thought, like, what would be a cool thing would be for the two of us to go back to more, like, um, older classic films, to an extent, as well as uh, to get either just to gush about them or not gush about them or just general discussion about them. And that's what I thought would be the perfect start for episode one would be yes. the 1972 uh, crime drama, uh, The Godfather, 
directed by yes. directed by Francis Ford Coppola, written by Francis Ford Coppola and Mario Puzo. Mario Puzo, the author of the Godfather novels, and uh, obviously obviously stars Marlon Brando as Don Vito Corleone, Al Pacino mm. as Michael Corleone, uh, Robert Duvall as Tom Hagen, James Kahn, Talia Shire, John Cazale, Ava Goda. All That's the people, all the names. probably. And a number of other Italian-Americans that I can't think of right now. Yes. The, and the premise of The Godfather, according to Letterboxd, is spanning the years, 1945 to 1955, a chronicle of the fictional Italian-American Corleone crime family. When organized crime family patriarch Vito Corleone barely survives an attempt on his life, his youngest son, Michael, steps in to take care of the would-be killers, launching a campaign of bloody revenge. I'm not sure how I feel about that exact description of the Corleone. Yeah, no, that that's box. not, not really. It, it, it's kind <laughs> of that, but... Kind of, to an extent. But, to I an mean, extent. But, this is the, the first time... You reading that out is the first time I realized that it spanned a lot of years. Yes. Which I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that yeah. later on. So, Robbie, yeah. this is my, I watched this last night uh, in preparation mm-hmm. for, for the, the, I've seen this film multiple times. I think the first time I saw this film, I was 17 years old because mm-hmm. um, other things I just want to mention about The Godfather, uh, just to establish it a bit more. It's a film that has a 98% on the tomato meter. It has a 98% audience score as well on Rotten Tomatoes. It is, It has a 9.2 out of 10 on IMDb, making it the number two ranked film on the top 250, only behind The Shawshank Redemption. On Letterboxd, it is the number two ranked film on the top 250, with a 4.6 out of 5 rating, only behind Parasite. On the American Film Institute top 100 films of all time it ranks at number two only behind citizen kane and on the british film institute's sight and sound top 100 which is a list that every 10 years gets updated we're coming up to it soon this as of 2012 the godfather ranks number 21 on that list tied with jean-luc godard's Le Mepris and michelangelo antonioni's Le aventura it's a film that oh, no. it's a film that is nominated that got nominated for um, eleven Academy Awards. It got the best original score got rejected because it didn't because it reused a um, a classic Italian track, so it didn't count as an original score. So that got revoked. But the film was nominated for best film editing, best sound, best costume design. Best Director for Francis Ford Coppola. It had three Support and Actor nominations, being James Kahn, Robert Duvall, and Al Pacino. Fun fact, Al Pacino refused to show up at the Academy Awards because he believed that he was wrongfully categorised as he felt he was the lead, not the Support and Actor. I'd Um, agree with him. I agree with that as well. And it won three Academy Awards, being... Best Adapted Screenplay from Coppola and Puzo. Best Lead Actor for Marlon Brando, which, fun fact, I want to say this here, Brando did not attend the ceremony, choosing instead to have himself represented by a Native American Californian actress as a uh, platform for her to speak upon the fact that America was not... uh, given equal job roles to Native Americans, which I thought was a very Aww. generous way well done, for man. Brando. And also the film won Best Picture. So... Okay. Uh, this this worries me. Okay. And so this is... All of the things you are listing worry me. <laughs> so, safe to say, it is one of the most um, heavily acclaimed films of all time. I've yeah. seen this film multiple times. Robbie, I'm saying this right off the bat. This is firmly in my top ten. Um, this okay. is a firm top 10 favorite film of mine and you've recently you told me recently you saw this when was it just like last week what yeah like yeah three or four days ago yeah so not not long ago for the first time in my life yes so what i want to say is 
let's start off with our initial spoiler-free thoughts on the film. Okay. Go ahead, Robbie. It's real fucking long, isn't it? It's real fucking long. Clocking I... in at two hours and 57 minutes. Yeah. Um. Okay. Spoiler-free thoughts. Yes. Our initial... Ju- just um... our initial thoughts right off the bat. Okay. My general overview of the film would be I completely understand why it's a classic movie. It's real good to a to an extent. <laughs> um oh god, I don't cuz this is why I was so worried when you were listing off all the things that it's acclaimed from and I'm like, yeah, but all oh, right. Right. I understand why it's critically yes. acclaimed. I understand why it's a classic. Um for me it's 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 real long for no reason, <laughs> like re- really unnecessarily long. Um, but you know, good all the same. Everyone's really good in mm-hmm. it. Um, it's uh, there's some performances that I didn't quite that didn't quite connect okay. with me, um, which we'll, we can talk about yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but generally, I liked it, but I kept checking my watch. I thought the pacing was kind of off. That, that would be my general thoughts. Okay. And I want to also preface that we we have had a very, very brief conversation on The Godfather. So I know bits and pieces of yeah. your feelings towards specific parts of it. For me, again, fresh off watching it yesterday, last night, and also having mm-hmm. the morning to think about it again a bit more, I see your point. We've... We've disagreed yeah. with film lengths before anyway of a, a, <laughs> another mob film starring Al Pacino. The Irishman is the one that comes to mind, which I, yeah. which at some point on this show, I wouldn't mind discussing. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. At one point, you know? yeah. But uh, my opinion, I think that, again, you've only seen the first film. You haven't, you're coming from this. Yeah, not- no, I didn't know anything yeah. about the story or anything. Oh, right. Okay, so... Uh, I thought Pacino. I didn't know Pacino was. Oh really? In it. I, wow. Right. I thought because I my thought with with it was always that because I know that the Godfather Part Two is a prequel. It's about right. It's it's a pre it's a prequel of. and a sequel. Right. Okay. But I always thought that Pacino was only in the second one and he played young Brando, but he he's oh. not. He's like the main character. Yeah. I, I knew not, so I knew absolutely nothing about the plot. Anything so were you happened. just really confused when Pacino walked into the wedding? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, what? Wait, hang on, what? And then the uh, as you you know you said about the um, the attempt on Brando's life, which was in the yeah, description. That's, that again, you gave, that's not so a spoiler. I don't. Uh, that's not a spoiler. Which I want to. Which I, want, I I didn't know that happened. Yeah, yeah <laughs> honestly, so first time when I saw the film, I was like, wait, what? And but yeah, yeah definitely. But my, I, again, as I said, this is firmly within my top 10 of all time. And it's a film that through time that I just, when I first watched it, I knew I liked it. I knew I really mm-hmm. liked it. But then it was one of these films that really just stuck with me. And then I watched it again. And to yeah. me, I think, again, it's a really generic thing to say as a film fan to talk about The Godfather. But I do think it is, and again, we could talk about it more in detail. I do honestly think it is one of the most perfect story arcs in any film ever. And it's, and I think, because I love, what I've realized I love, even though I'm a big fan of specific character stories, Mm -hmm. a lot of my favorite films are about multiple people. My favorite film, my favorite film of all time is 12 Angry Men, which is 12 people. And another one of my favorites is Seven Samurai. You get to know seven different people yeah definitely i know right and i also love like the before trilogy which is a two character piece and but Mm -hmm. i'm also a big fan of a character study on one person and i think that even though the godfather is a massive ensemble film like there's like just it's huge oh yeah it's truly is a big it's a story purely on the development of Michael Culleon. And I think yeah. that that works. And I think it's, and his arc in this film alone, not even including his arc in the second film, his arc in 
the first film, I think, might be the for me personally, I think it might be the single best example of a character's development. Okay. From I have what... thoughts on that statement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that, and that, but within we'll that, but within that, I also love the general establishment of all the characters in it. I yeah. love like yeah, each yeah. and every single character and I okay, not love each and every single character. That's not true. I I don't love every character because I think mm-hmm. that's a bit of a, a statement that's interesting to say. But yeah. I think that it definitely attaches you to a good few characters. And I think yeah. it does a damn good job at making you like care for Yeah, I think all of them. But I, I mean, I think my favorite character in the whole thing was probably Sonny. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that Michael's seems... brother. Yeah. Um, I really liked that performance, and I can't remember the actor's name off the top of my head. James Khan. That's James Khan. James Khan. Right. Really good. Mm-hmm. Really liked it. He was like, he was like a, a classic mobster, but not really. Like he mm-hmm. was funny, but also smart. And all this kind of stuff. He was really good. I liked that character. Yeah, a lot. yeah. This and this film. What's inter- what, what also is interesting to think about. This film came out in 1972. So in a way, mm-hmm. this is the first mob film when we think of mob films today. Yeah, I think because I know I know there was mob films prior to this, like James Cagney in the 30s had um, a lot of mafia films and stuff. Of course, like stuff like after the events of the Prohibition era and Capone, there was like some films that took place during that time period. I mean, heck even, yeah. even Billy Wilder's some like it hot to an extent is a mafia film yeah. in a way. But this is when you think, I think when we think mafia mob film, like of mm-hmm. our generation, I think um, the, uh, I mean, I think Goodfellas to an extent because of yeah, the style. Yeah, I think Goodfellas. That. That's what I was going to say. But I think if it wasn't for the archetype that The Godfather set, I don't think we would have like what it. I don't no. think we. I don't think we would have a strong contingency of Italian American mob because I think that's no. like the, especially what established The Godfather and also the seventies was a big t- known as New Hollywood, which was a lot yeah. more of a grittier just more um I, w- I don't want to say counterculture anti no, more um l- unconventional types of films came out from the 70s yeah it's when and, you start getting scorsese and his kind of stuff yeah the uh, streets all that kind of thing uh the the film school brats as they're known as yeah uh, like coppola scorsese spielberg and lucas are like yeah that. but also de palma is also another name that came from that time yeah. period but all but you need but this time period came from, of course, Bonnie and Clyde from 1967 was the kind of like establishment of like more mm-hmm. violent films. And of course, like to the, uh, the the death at the end in particular, we, which uh, I'm pretty sure the, Arthur Penn was the director of that. And didn't he yes. say that he was like, he wanted it to be like a ballet or something? I think so. Yeah. Like what a weird thing to yeah. say, but there's something, there's something in this movie that made me, think of that exact scene which, which we'll talk about which i do have a point to make about that scene yeah. specifically but and also two years after bonnie and clyde we got easy rider which mm-hmm. was another big movement in counterculture cinema um have you seen easy rider i haven't seen easy rider no that's definitely some of that i want to okay bring it but that was a film like dennis hopper directed it he starred in it and wrote it as well peter fonda mm-hmm. started that was a film purely about um um screw the system we're gonna make a film that we want to make and mm-hmm. that and that kind of bled its way into the 70s where it showed where it get allowed filmmakers to almost be the 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 stars of the show in order in order to kind of be like no i want to make this really like gritty grungy type of film even if it's not a gritty film because the godfather is a very clean film i think overall it's quite a, it's i yeah. think i think it's quite a clean polished film but there's also a sense which this is why i love the 70s there's just something so raw about each performance in it yeah 100%. As well. like um yeah. 
specifically, there's a moment um, with John Cazale, who plays Fredo in it, where yeah. he sat on the curb just crying. And there's just something about the way he yeah. has that. It just feels so just like unpolished and just like yeah. in the moment. And that's Do you know what, what does feel polished though? What? His big old forehead. <laughs> dude's got a massive forehead. God bless I just John wanted, I just wanted to put that out there, but God dude's got a huge forehead. God bless John Cazale. So that's, yeah. our, <laughs> so that's our initial thoughts, General, on the film. Mm-hmm. Let's delve into some positives. Still spoiler free. Okay. So just general positives. I'll step in first. Go on. I think of um, pushing aside the acting for a second because I think it's that's like, of course, the main standout. Yeah, thing, yeah. I think I genuinely feel the cinematography is something special. Yeah, it's film. really good stuff. And uh, later on in the podcast, we are going to be discussing some trivia, but I'm going to jump in with trivia with specific to cinema the cinematography on mm-hmm. the film um because one thing if you notice it's the way it's because the way I, what i love about the film it's the way it's lit it's like yeah. especially in comparison to films from that from for even films prior to that they were all quite well lit and they were all oh, quite, yeah. like even another film which came out if you look at it yeah prior to the godfather 1971 a clockwork orange that's a mm-hmm. that's a gritty grungy film but that's still very well lit. Whereas yeah. The Godfather, oh, yeah. like I think that's a f- like the lighting in that film really makes it like get, it. It almost establishes a new time has come in the way we are going to present films. It visually, yeah. I think. And what I found interesting, this factoid here: cinematographer Gordon Willis earned himself the nickname "The Prince of Darkness" since his sets were so underlit. Param- wow. Paramount Pictures executives initially thought that the footage was too dark until persuaded otherwise by Willis and Francis Ford Coppola that it was to emphasise the shadiness of the Colleons family dealings. Interesting. So he was doing he was doing film school stuff yes. <laughs> before, before it would be analysed in film school. Definitely, yeah. I mean, like, the, yeah, I think that, I mean, the specifically the lighting in... Collion's office. Oh yeah, like that's be- that's become its own just kind of like can't it's just kind of become a logo for the movie. Is that is that shot of Brando in his office? Oh the uh, like the heavily the heavily shadowed. Yeah, yeah. That, that specifically, like the lighting has basically become what the movie's known for. Like when you think of the Godfather, you think that image. You think you the du- you think those dark visuals. Yeah, yeah. Generally. I mean, yeah. and the God like any T shirt to do with the Godfather and stuff. It's got that. It's that light himself. Yeah, on, on Brando's I mean, face. I've got, I've, I mean, I've got a uh, a beer mat of uh, of oh, now. brilliant cars and, you have. And but that, but yeah, again, that's but that's just the image. Like that's yeah. like that. Um, it's it it it's just iconic as well. Yeah, is the word definitely, definitely. And that's a the other thing I want to. Uh, I'll let you. I I just want to say one more thing about that specific scene about the opening scene because how i usually i was kind of i was preparing this last night for my viewing of this film i stuck on the blu-ray and i had on me telly um and i just had i had a few lamps on and i thought and i like one blind open anyway and i thought ah you know just casually sit and watch this and then the film Mm -hmm. starts and you get that the score start playing which i think is which I, which is one of my favorite themes ever of a film, yeah. And it starts uh, creeping in. You have Paramount Pictures presents, and then it pops up Mario Puzo's The Godfather, and then mm-hmm. it fades into the close up of I forgot the dude's name, but it fades into that close up of the guy talking about um, his daughter. Yeah, and it does his, the long dolly shot. Yeah, talking about his daughter getting um, beaten by two guys, and it's just that close up that moves out, and it's heavily shadowed, and. As soon as that shot came up, I was right into the film again. I was like, right, I need to be immersed in this film. I immediately, yeah, yeah. I turned off the lamps, I closed the blinds, and I sat <laughs> down. I was like, I, like, like, I just think that there's so many shots, and there's a certain shot in Sicily, which we'll get more like plot yeah, specific yeah. within that. There's a shot in Sicily where it's just a wide shot, and it's the music playing, and it's a similar yeah. thing on a Hollywood. Uh, 
studio lot where it's wide shots and music's playing. And Mm -hmm. I just think that that is, again, it's going to sound right wanky, but it's (laughs) like... But to me, that's just like pure cinema, cinematic storytelling at its best. I think when it's just a big old yeah. wide shot with just, just really cool ass music, and you're feeling a progression of a narrative with nothing being spoken. Yeah, like just the fact that you can create a feeling. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You yeah, know, it, it's it's one of those movies where you just like. It, it has a tone to it. Like, it has a specific mm-hmm. feeling and aesthetic. And as soon as it starts, you're like, oh, yeah, it's The Godfather. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like anything else. Yeah. And I love how, like, Brando's... It's very singular in that. Yeah, definitely. And I love how Brando's introduction is an over-the-shoulder shot. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like it's just... It, they almost knew he was going to be iconic before, like, it even, like, yeah. became iconic really yeah which, 100%. Like, it, it's it's really cool i think but yeah uh, i'll pass it off to you for some other comments so, and positives okay positives um i really liked the structure of the movie generally like as you were saying about the progression of michael's character it's really well handled mm-hmm. like it's it's really well done and and there's like I'll get onto this later on. Yes. I thought the movie ended at a point, and it didn't. And <laughs> when I think back to it, I think, yeah, if the movie had ended there, you wouldn't have got as good a progression as you do. What would like, the fi- what, what is the film? Like if like what would the film be if that was the ending? Yeah, exactly. It would just be kind of like a guy. He kind of goes a bit bad doesn't he yeah yeah and then yeah, it finishes exactly, yeah. do you know what i mean but i think just it's yeah i think the structure's really good that would be my first positive the music mm-hmm. as you were saying before is mint so that that wasn't so me and my dad were having this discu- uh, discussion i watched it with my dad he was the one that made me watch right. it because he was like that's ridiculous right that but yeah that. I, that's another thing i want to say the godfather is like the dad film Oh uh, yeah, like it, 100%. It, it's hundred percent. It's that it's, and Saving Private Ryan. I was gonna say it's that. So, and, <laughs> I, I was gonna say it's that and the Good, the Bad, the Ugly. I was gonna yeah. say like those are like it's, yeah, hundred percent. There's just specific dad films. Rock, Rocky, <laughs> Rocky's another one. Rocky's another one. But yeah, the Godfather. Um, Godfather yeah. is one. Yeah, good. Yeah. But yeah, it, it just made me watch it. It was like what? What are you doing? Specifically, because before we started watching it, my least favorite film of all time was on the telly. Uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Okay, that's fair. I haven't seen on. it. But and I, I was care. like, I hate this film. Why are you watching this? And he was like, oh, I've never seen it. I was like, yeah, it's like my least favourite film ever made. Like, I'm rendering a thing upstairs and I'll, I've come downstairs to sit with you and I don't want this. <laughs> and he was, he was saying like, oh, but you've, like, you know, you've seen everything and all this. And I was like, there's films that I haven't seen. Like, there's films that I haven't seen that I, sh- that I know that I should have. Like, I haven't seen The Godfather. And he's like, what? I got real angry. <laughs> And then there was a DVD trilogy in the in the cupboard that he just whipped out and was like, "Yeah, we're watching it. <laughs> what, th- this is the ridiculous." But we were got like, it was to yeah, it was the bit in Sicily. I remember specifically saying to my dad, the "Music's good, isn't it?" Mm. And he was like, "Yeah, it's pretty good." I, d- I was he said, "I don't know if it was like written for the movie or if it was." already a song that they just repurposed for the film, so it was just repurposed Italian music. There's certain songs in there. Which right. makes it disqualified for an original score category yeah. at the Oscars. But, but I the, think the main theme was that I, I composed think, for the film. I think that is originally composed. I do think that because okay. I've looked up that theme many times, and I think it is just literally known as the Godfather theme. Right. Okay. Or like, hang uh, on. Yeah. Like, I've got, I've got. The, I had the soundtrack playing earlier. Hang on. <laughs> um, of course you did. Oh god! Did. It's called uh, the Godfather Waltz. So it's yeah. So it's probably yeah, yeah. yeah. It's real good. I like the music a lot. To touch mm. on the acting, yes, very briefly. Um, most everyone is real good in it. Emphasis on the most everyone. We'll get to it in the negatives. Okay, <laughs> but who who like, who's who's the who's the standout actors for you? You said James Khan already. James Khan, um, Pacino, obviously, yes, is amazing. Yes, but there's like. Little bit parts, like the dude. Um, to be really non-spoilery, 
the dude that just shows up at the hospital, he he's real good. Yeah, I liked um, Enzo. Enzo was the character's I, name. Yeah, Enzo. Yeah, I like the dude. The the I'm real bad with names. I like the big guy, and they say his name over and over again. Like Luca, Luca something. Lu- Luca Brazzi. That's the one. He. I've got fun facts about him. Um, according to my dad, he, he was a he was a mobster for a bit in real life. Yep. I think he was, <laughs> apparently, and I think he was a professional wrestler as well. Yeah, he was a yeah, yeah, he yeah. Was a professional wrestler, and then he was in like the Colombian cartel or something. I don't yeah, know. somewhere it's like not, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. But back in the t- like, back in the time, the seventies, back in the time where if you were doing a mob film, you could just get actual mobsters to be in. Yeah, your you film. could just get actual <laughs> mobsters to be in it. <laughs> But that, he that, was real that, good. That, that happened as far into even Reservoir Dogs because uh, Joe Cabot was a former uh, yeah, yeah. criminal. It's like, like, how was that just a thing that they could do? It was it's just, just like, allowed, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But like, I, I think he was real good. I, I specifically, it's not really a spoiler, but I specifically like the bit right at the beginning where he's like trying to read that speech yeah. that he's been preparing for ages. That's he's, really funny. He's, he's sat, he's like, Don Corley, Don Corley on, thank <laughs> Thank- and then like and like Kay's like going to Michael like Michael who is that why is he talking yeah, to himself what, what's he doing <laughs> yeah he, he was great and he goes into the office and he stumbles his words I love it yeah he's still <laughs> fucked up <laughs> yeah he's, he's he's great I really liked him I liked Enzo that dude at the beginning that we were on about like in the genuinely in the opening shot he was really good yes Um, I thought yeah I think that was that's probably it for my like standouts in the movie. I like the police chief because I hated him. Oh, so yeah. like he did he did his job well. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Like so. Yeah, we're both yeah. Uh, we're both um, Annie Hall fans. And yeah. Um, and I like Diane Keen a lot. What was your uh, thoughts on her in this film? Wait, what? She, <laughs> Excuse me. She's Kay Adams. <laughs> Oh my Christ, dude, man! You know what? This is what I mean. <laughs> like, how did I? How would I not realize that? That's brilliant. I've, that's so obviously hair as well. Now that I'm looking back at it, like, yeah, good doy, fucking idiot, right? Um. Anyway, what's yeah. your, what was your thoughts on Kay, uh, Diane Keaton in this film? Diane Keaton in this movie. Um, yeah. She she serves her purpose, yep. is what I'd say. Mm-hmm. She 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 serves her role well, mm-hmm. um, but she's not. She's not got loads to do. Like there's a no, there's a spe- yeah. there's a specific point in the movie that I don't you know I won't delve into because of spoilers right. and stuff. How about but, this? Save that point because we may as well save it when we get more into spoilery stuff. Yeah. Okay. We'll okay. yeah we'll save it for the spoilers. Um. Another positive I like to throw out there, mm-hmm. just to also have someone in there. One thing I read: the sound design is so good in this film. Yeah, like I didn't re- like like. There's a specific point where um, Connie, played by Talia Shire, is, is in a scene mm-hmm. crying, and then it immediately cuts to um, a baby crying. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, and I'm like, I, I don't like sort of things like that. It just Real flows good. seamless. It just flows so seamless in it. And there's other things that I can't. Yeah. I can't. There's other just very subtle sound stuff. And I think it's been since being in university and having to study sound a bit more often that that's been a yeah. thing that really has been more noticeable to me. Like there's a moment um, in the restaurant scene, in a restaurant scene of uh, Michael. Uh, and a few other mobsters where there's almost like you can hear almost like a train going over tracks type of thing building yeah, up to just a, put that in building up to a moment and there's no identification that that restaurant is near any train tracks whatsoever but and it works anyway yeah because but yeah. that also helps almost like now you're imagining this restaurant is under a bridge that 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 train's going it just that helps build the world a bit more i think and also and then it goes silent and then it then you hear the train tracks pick back up again until the act is done which i just think's really cool yeah Yeah. it's good stuff and and yeah it just just does it just does help build like world building as well i think 
And also, yeah. like, and also, generic as hell. But when the police officer is introduced, he's walking in in the shadows, yeah, and then and as just... soon and as soon as a light shines on his, and as soon as like he comes out of the shadows, thunder strikes, and then it starts raining. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just like, like, but I'm not sure. Was it generic at that point, or was that at that time? Was that like, oh my god, that's so cool. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I, as soon as I saw that, I instantly thought Raiders. You know, yeah, like when in, yeah. Indiana Jones is first introduced, and he just like steps out of the shadows and stuff. I was like, hmm, yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's quite similar, isn't it, well, Mr. Spielberg? Well, Coppola and Spielberg are good friends, mates. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but yeah, um, uh, we briefly talked about some positives. Let's go a little bit on some negatives because, okay. as much as I think. As much as I love this film, and I jokingly uh, said this to uh, uh, friends of mine, Gary and Lewis, last night when I finished the film, I posted, a, I just posted a video of the credits to them, and I went, "Literally a perfect film, just to be taking the piss," because Gary hasn't seen yeah. it. Gary hasn't seen it, so I keep ta- so I keep telling <laughs> Gary, yeah, yeah, I went, "Why haven't you seen it?" Uh, but um, so, but as much as I love a load, of, as much as I love films, I don't think any film is perfect. There's obviously going to be mm-hmm. faults in any film. There's a few things in this that I can nitpick out and talk about, but probably not as much as you can. That makes it sound like you're going to shit on it, which you're not. I'm but, not going to... Yeah, right, but, okay. Before I get into negatives, I just want yes. to preface this by saying, this is, this goes for all episodes of this podcast yes. going forward. Yes, yeah, there you go. Um, and again, yeah, right. again our uh, own opinion. We're not saying this is fact. This yeah, is what we right. get from a film. Just to preface it, I when I go into negatives on things generally, I am known to go far with it, right? <laughs> so I just I just I lose myself and I go way more into it. I get too into being negative, right? So I just <laughs> want to say before I start talking about it, I liked this movie, all right? Yes. So just everyone calm down. We're gonna we're gonna be discussing it in more detail a, a, yeah. a bit. So yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, generally speaking, I liked the movie. So. Leave me alone. But if again, you get angry, if you get angry about the negative stuff that I say, I'm, I'm sorry. But again, no, no film is perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So go on, Robbie. Okay. I'll let you kick it off first. Right. Okay. So as much as I said, I liked the structure of this movie. Mm-hmm. It's my. This is my main complaint. Just generally, it's so fucking long. <laughs> like it's so long. And what annoys me about it, and I'd be fine with that, because, like, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy and stuff like that. Oh, right, okay. When something needs to be long, I'm cool with that. But it's when I can see full plot threads that I like, you can take that out. Okay. It doesn't need to be there. Just take it out and you'd be fine. In the I, movie, you'd go on normally. I know which one you're and on it about. annoys me. I know which one you're... Yeah, we there's, briefly a, co- there's a couple about. where I'm like, yeah. I just... I don't understand why that needs to be in there. <laughs> but that be, that would be my first negative. You 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 go ahead. Right. Again, we'll discuss more about that and more negatives will be discussed in a spoiler way. Yeah. But what I my neg my negatives are literally like like technical points that I need that I need to pull out. And it's like certain okay. like it and again, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say these things, and anyone who's listening to this and you Robbie as well you're never going to okay. be able you're never going to be able to unsee what i'm about to say right there's there's two oh, specific Christ. there's two specific things there's a fight scene there's a fight scene that happens in the streets and i'm not oh. gonna, i'm not going to say who between because that's spoiler i, I know exactly i know exactly what you mean the way the camera's positioned you can see the pure distance in between a punch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you know exactly yeah. what I mean. And, I know exactly what you mean. And to me as well, also being a professional wrestling fan, I can spot that a mile away as well when wrestlers really have like a proper distance in between them. And I know and but, Oh yeah. But the thing is with film as well, you could redo that take. You can just do it again. Yeah, yeah, but to be fair, that that's a little thing. I'm not saying that's ru- that ruins yeah. the film for me. That's just a little thing to be like, way. And there's another thing. Yeah, it's not nothing like bad. I praised the sound design earlier. There's one horrific ADR, and once you notice it, you're you might have already noticed it, Rob. I, I I haven't noticed that. But once you all notice it, 
you're never going to unsee okay. it. Because I got, because I, I remember watching a Rooster Teeth podcast and then the, the uh, this got pointed out and then I just couldn't unsee it. And now it's like, <laughs> God damn it. There's a scene in Las Vegas where yeah. someone, where, and there is a guy, and Mo Green, it's with Mo Green. Mo um, Green, who I thought was Steve Martin for a little bit. <laughs> that's too funny. When he first showed up, he looks like Steve Martin. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. But there's a Do bit. Do you know what I mean? But there's a bit, right, that I wait, I always wait for it to happen. There's an ad, yeah. there, there's an ADR thing, and he's, and he's going off on uh, the, co- the, co- the member of the Collion family. He's going, mm-hmm. uh, and he's uh, da, 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 talking normally. And then he goes, and then you hear, I talk to Bazzini, which is clearly Adlet, and then, which is clearly ADR. And then he goes <laughs> yeah. back, and then he just goes back to speaking normally. Like and then his normal voice is just keeps going, which I is noticed that. which again is so it's kind of inspiring that yeah. a film that is claimed is heralded as the greatest film ever by many different uh, publications oh, yeah. that there's that there and every oh, time yeah. and every time I watch it I, I wait for it and I go. I talk to Bazzini, and it is proper. Like, <laughs> how couldn't they? Like, it almost sounds like the mic. The mic isn't even. It, the mic isn't as clear as the mic that they were using as well, because it, it, it almost. You can hear feedback almost as well. Not feedback. You can almost hear yeah, like. But- you can almost hear the microphone wasn't like filtered as well. So it literally goes <laughs> from two different audio qualities, which again, it's like a little goof and it's a little bit of a negative. It's again, nothing that ruins the film, but it's, oh, yeah. it's, it, it's a mistake and it's, and it's a bit, and it's funny to me. Fair enough. But, um, I never noticed that. And I've again, one more, but it's like, go on, go on. Okay. This is, I, 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 think before we get into the spoilers and i'll talk about what i think could be taken out of the movie mm. like i think this is the one that's gonna cause the most controversy <laughs> right I, i'm looking forward to this right call me what you want but i i i didn't like brando Oh, I'm yeah. really sorry. Oh, no, he's the right. one performance that really didn't click with me at all right? like d- just nothing just not, I like, I couldn't understand the word he was saying. Right. I, I had no idea what he was saying. And I said this to my dad. I was like, I, I, I have no idea what this man is saying. And my dad yelled, yeah, but that's the point. And I was like, what? I was, I was like, well, if, if I'm, if the point is that I can't understand what he's saying, then what's the point in writing a script? Right. I, <laughs> I, I, I just, I don't understand. I want to say again. I'm throwing up some trivia here because I want to say his voice wasn't just Brando being awkward. Yeah, his voice was based off a real life mobster, Frank Costello, and okay. uh, Brando had seen him on television during um, certain hearings of court in 1951, and that's where he got the husky whisper, like yeah, like. Um, influence so it's based off like that type of vocal range is based off an actual mobster i'm not saying that excuses anything i'm just saying that that's why that was chosen to be like that and he had like cotton wool in his mouth well that's a bit of a know about that he put he put cotton wool in his mouth during the audition they made an actual mouthpiece for the film oh right okay that that's just that's an urban. It's like he put cotton wool during this film. It's like, well, for the audition he did, and then they made an actual mouthpiece for it. Right. Okay. But I just, yeah, he just all the way through. I there was specific points where I knew what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Right. But for a lot of it, I that man could have been saying anything, and I wouldn't know. Every scene that he was in, I was trying to pick up the context of what was happening from the replies of the people were given to him. <laughs> It was so annoying, and he just you you you're waiting for like James Khan to say something. Yeah. It's like, wait, what's the relevance? I was like, what's this about? Then they all go, oh, we're getting really annoyed about this. And I'm like, oh right, okay, that's fine. I get it now. But like, he just yeah, Br- I really wasn't taken with Brando. His voice annoyed yeah. me, and I just didn't get the hype around him okay. in this movie at all. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm real sorry. I, as much as I absolutely flat out adore this film, I don't, I don't say it all Brando's the 
highlight of the film. Yeah. I never, I never, I've never once thought that. I will agree with you to an extent. Yeah, I will agree with you to an extent that I've never once thought that he was the highlight of a film. Okay. to the film, but I do. Again, I'm not sure. Again, I don't agree with the fact he was he got put forward for the lead actor cap. Yeah, no, he's don't not agree in with that a lot of it. He, but I also don't with the, agree with the fact that Anthony Hopkins got put forward with the lead actor category with Signs of the Lambs. What? I didn't know that. Did you not know that? That's so he dumb. Won be, he, he, he won best lead actor for Signs of the Lambs. But, yeah. but he isn't the lead. Yeah. Jodie Foster won best lead actress as well. But okay. Hopkins won best lead actor. But Hopkins was the support. Yeah, he's definitely the support in there. And to me, Brando's a support. In yeah, hundred percent. Like without doubt. And I and I said this to you uh, through on Facebook when you told me about this. I went, he's been kind of billed as like he was kind of like the main role in quotation marks because Brando was the biggest name yeah. in the film at the time. Because in the early nineteen seventies, who was Al Pacino? Who was James yeah. Khan? Who was all these people? Who was Coppola? Coppola wasn't bringing anyone in, no. like at that time. So the only people that were, so it was Brando, you know, already Academy Award winning actor. Yeah, of course he's going to be like the forefront of marketing. I get that, and I also, and I, you know what, and I'm also fine with him being put on the front of the posters because when you're watching the film for the first time. He is the main guy. Yeah. Like, to an extent, up until a certain point of the film, and then he's not the main character. I just, like, I'd say that he's, he's a plot device. Yes, and no, so I agree. Like, I totally it, agree. It would be like, it's like I would understand if a poster for, going, going back to Raise the Lost Actress, the movie that's in my head, it'd be fine, mm-hmm. like, if the poster was a picture of the arc, I'd get it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's what the movie revolves around. Yeah, no, he's the catalyst. Like so, everything, yeah. like everything that happens to everything that happens in the film is because of Brand. Is because of Vito Corleone. Yeah, like, well, he's not the that, main that, character. That, uh, no, and I and I one hundred percent, I understand where you come from. Yeah. within that. So, within that being said, I've realised a lot of our spoiler-free stuff is a lot. We can't really discuss yeah, yeah. that too much. <laughs> so what? I'll, so we'll do a little mini wrap up on spoiler on spoiler free stuff mm-hmm. so as a wrap up my personal thing is if you haven't seen the godfather y- you need to yeah i just think it's a film that is worth watching um i'm not i don't think it's on any streaming services i'm unsure i don't think it is i don't think so, so. no so get yourself on amazon and just order the set yeah <laughs> just do that yeah just do that i think it's worth it it's a film that uh for me personally again it's firmly in my top 10 favorite films of all time i think it's one of the greatest ever made yeah um and i don't think that because i've been told to think that by other by uh, outside influences that's been a thing that i've just come to really appreciate throughout time yeah so my opinion highly recommend watching it i also think if you're not and if you don't like the highly stylized mob films like Scorsese is revolutionized, mm-hmm. if you think that's a bit too um, sensational and if you think it glorifies the crime world, I think The Godfather might be the mob film for you then because I don't think it's, it's a glorification of it all. If anything, if you like The Irishman, I would say The Godfather is... Ki- and if you like The Irishman and you haven't seen The Godfather... I think the Irishman. I think the Godfather's more up your alley in terms of that. Yeah, I'd agree. Cycle of things. Uh, any final spoiler-free thoughts, Rob? Uh, like just overall. Yeah, my overall final thoughts on it. Spoiler-free would be if you haven't seen it and you're a film person who likes all the movies and stuff, mm-hmm. watch it. You need to. Like it, it's it's got so many things that have become so commonplace in cinema since then. That is like there's lines, there's iconic lines. Yeah, it's like it's, it's a definitive like... movie that you need to see. Uh, but my, it's it wasn't quite for me because it was real long. <laughs> it, that's interesting, which is makes me think that I'm going to be very interested when we talk about Godfather Part Two eventually. Yeah, because I, I, I'm I'm watching it at some point this week. Oh right, okay. Yeah. We're just, but yeah, so. Yes, I'm excited about it. 
If you haven't, so there you go. If you haven't seen, oh God, see, knock the microphone. <laughs> if you haven't seen the God, if you haven't seen the Godfather, warning now, we will be discussing spoilers. Yes. So give you some chance. Go watch the Godfather. Come yeah, back. Just go watch it. Hear what we have to say. So, Robbie, spoiler-filled <laughs> stuff now. <laughs> Let's get on to it. I'll let you lead the way right away. Go on. Okay. So this is what I want to talk about. To get my negative thoughts out of the way first, yes. right? My whole thing about it being overly long and there being specific plot threads that could just be like, yep, take it out. Mm-hmm. Like, they're lingering, just whip it out. It doesn't need to be there. Mm-hmm. There's two that spring to mind. And there's, there's like, little bits I want to talk about as well that don't really fit structurally for me. Okay. So the one that's not as bad, and I can kind of understand why it's in the movie, because it gives James Caan something to do, right? <laughs> the whole thing with uh, the sister, Connie. Connie be- and I forgot the husband's name. Carlo. Yeah, Carlo, yeah. Her being beaten by Carlo, right, is like a full half-hour segment of the movie. That means fuck all. Nothing comes of it. By the end of the movie... Her and Carlo are still together. No, they're and not. And she gets pissed off. At, well, she gets pissed off at Michael for having him killed. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you so if you didn't take if you took that out right and make Sonny be killed because of something else Carlo did, right, and then at the end have the bit where he's like, "Yo, Carlo, you bloody oh, you nearly had my brother, you had my brother killed or whatever," and then he dies, right? That'd be fine, and I wouldn't have to go through this whole thing of like. Oh, he's he's beating his wife so, and all this. So you would rather right? This is where this podcast is also going to fit nicely in because as much as we, <laughs> as much as we love each other, Robbie, we love bickering with films. About yeah, we just, disagree a lot. Yeah. So as opposed to just having that be the case, you would much rather it be like what Carlo was like dealing with another crime family, or some no, some like, other convoluted bullcrap or whatever. What I'm saying is. <laughs> right. right, everyone, calm down. <laughs> right. It's me. What? It's just me. everyone, what? calm down. It's me. Everyone, calm down. <laughs> right. What I'm saying is that it just goes nowhere. It literally goes to Michael. <laughs> it literally, what? it literally shows. It, it, it's the, it's literally an arc of Michael actually showing. I don't even care if you're in with my sister. I will have you killed no matter what. No. Like that's what that is because of but course because of course Michael's going to be killing other crime family members. Of course that's the case. Yeah, but but, that, but then he shows that, then that shows like his full like he goes from being this one type of character to a completely different character. And if he's just another mobster just killing other mobsters what else is that? That's like truly like shown his transformation into he's now not even like he's almost a completely unrecognizable person to K. Yeah. But I mean like right, okay. Here's so it kind of goes hand in hand with what's happening at the same time in okay. the movie. Right. Cause the whole thing in Sicily. Mm-hmm is so unbelievably irrelevant. Irrelevant. Did you... Yeah, it okay. just... Right. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you get your points going. Yeah, let, let, right, okay. I'll, 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 I'll shut up the, for a second. The character of Michael's wife, who is introduced in the movie, mm-hmm. is introduced for the sole reason to be killed. There is no other reason she is in the film. She is useless, and that entire portion of the movie where Michael's in Sicily is useless and at the same time the stuff that's happening in america is the sunny sunny connie and carlo stuff which is also irrelevant that full 45 minute chunk of the movie get it out it doesn't mean anything it's like i was just sat there the whole time oh i disagree firmly like this like this segment better come in clutch later on and make me appreciate why it exists because at the moment i feel like you're wasting my time francis and then it got to the end and you still wasted my time <laughs> you're literally go- are we frankie come on <laughs> come on bro i'm like i'm trying to enjoy this and there's just this big 45 minute chunk in the middle of nothing that leads nowhere and the ho- this is where i was gonna talk about diane keen because i said to my dad at this point when he got married in sicily i was like well what the fuck happened to her then and then she doesn't show up again for like 
all of the movie until like the last half an hour. Okay. And she does nothing when she's there, and it's never mentioned that he was married again. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Okay. No. Right. Shoot me down. <laughs> <laughs> right. I may, I may as well get to my point because I've got. Uh, I'm going to show you my notes for the film Robbie that I've made. Okay. Go I, for I, it. I've, oh I've, Jesus I've, Christ! I've got. I, it, I've got some notes on the <laughs> film here. Right. Let, let me skip to that specific bit. Nah, because it doesn't make sense if I just... Hang on. Okay, right. Where am I at here? Right. I highly disagree with you thinking that that is completely irrelevant. Right. Okay. I highly disagree with that. Because... Right. My... Right. At the beginning, it's established that Michael isn't he doesn't want to be a part of his family's business yeah. he's he doesn't he, he, it's when he talks about uh, johnny fontaine who <laughs> is basically frank sinatra even though i've got a fun little trivia fact about johnny about that whole thing with, okay. with, with that involves sinatra um that you know he's this icon he's this idol he's doing a nice little sing song and then Kay's like oh my god it's Johnny Fontaine. And then like Michael's like, yeah, my dad helped, helped him out there uh, mm-hmm. with his career to which uh, Kay's like, how? And then he's like, yeah, he kind of like got Luca Brazzi to point a gun at a, uh, a, 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 at a record label head and said like, you're, which is one of my favorite lines in the film. Um, your brains are either going to be on the paper or your signature is. I'm paraphrasing yeah. that. I just love that so much. And, and Al Pacino in that moment. Yeah. Fun fact, first guy to reference the I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse yeah, thing. Yeah. It's Pacino that says it first, yeah. which I was surprised about. Yeah, he made him an offer he couldn't refuse. And, yeah. yeah, And then there's a pause and Kay's just looking at him like, what is your family? And then to which, there's, yeah. to which Michael is just like looking down and he goes, that's my family, Kay, that's not me. Which uh, yeah, I, 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 I... I have a point about that. Right, okay. Because... Yeah, you go. You go first. Now I'll, I'll talk about it because it, it leads me on to talking about the Sicily thing. I need to go through all of yeah, this whole it, thing first it, to it. make my point relevant. Okay. To which then, Vito gets shot down. Uh, an assassination attempt is put mm-hmm. on him, which is that's why I was on about with John Cazale's small performance of him sitting on the curb and uh, yeah. cry. I just love that part of him, um, and then immediately. Michael is bring is brought together with family again, and to yeah. which I've got uh, my point here. Where's it at? Da, 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 da. Family tragedy can create a link to any family, mm-hmm. whether yeah, it, yeah. whether it be um, so a family member dying due to natural circumstances, or you know, if you if your dad so happens to be the don of a, a mafia and he just yeah. could, you know, if, if he's that happens. if he's shot picking up a pepper or whatever he was doing, an orange, which an orange, there you go. Which I want to throw this. In. I need to get this bit out of the way. With did you know? <laughs> fun fact: Did you notice whenever origin oranges are present in shot, something bad's going to happen, no matter what. I didn't realize that he got there's oh, there's a bowl. What do you mean? Um, the scene before. The horse's head. When the movie mm-hmm. producer is talking to Tom Hagen, there's a yeah. there's a bowl of oranges in the middle of the table. Good shit. The next scene, right. the horse's head's in his bed. Mm-hmm. Don Colleone goes to uh, pick out some origins. Origi- oranges. He gets shot down. Oranges. Oranges. He gets shot yeah. down. Mm-hmm. And the main one. How? Where does Don V. Colleone die? He dies in. Oh my god! He dies in an orange in an, thing. In an orange patch. So that's cool. Huh? Through, I never realised that. So fun fact: in The Godfather, if you ever see an orange, shit's gonna go down. That's basically okay. what. That's basically what. Does that going. does that count for the rest of the trilogy? I can't remember. I've only seen part two once. So okay, I I'm don't. Look I'm out not for it when sure. I watch them again. I'm honestly not sure about the second film, but yeah. Cool. Um. Anyway, yeah, so Vito gets shot down. That's mm-hmm. when Michael immediately goes closer to the family because he's not doing it in a way of a crime lord is, a, a crime family is making a hit on my job. It's my dad's being shot. 
Yeah. So he's immediately back into the family through that to try to make sure his dad is getting taken care of and all that stuff. And yeah. to which that leads him to the hospital where he's literally going to the hospital to visit his dad. Mm-hmm. Realizes no one there to protect him. Yeah. And then he then inadvertently gets wrapped up in it again with the corrupt police officer giving him a punch. And mm-hmm. I've also got a note here which we could delve further into. It's oh. it, it's Michael's inherent temper that brings him to the crime world. Cause it's not okay. it's not his it's not his want. It's not the it's not his it's not really his want to get revenge on the people who shot down his dad because he would have mm-hmm. if that was the case he would be right in it straight away. It's the yeah, fact it's just bad temper. It's the fact that the Colleons are heavily tempered people and he tries to put yeah. it away but it's going to come out in some I've got a, way. I've got a note about the punch. Okay. That bruise sticks around for way too long. Okay, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, anyway, but anyway, yeah. Continue. But yeah, so then there's other bits and pieces I got here. So him, he's already delving into the family, back in with <laughs> his family. He's getting back into with his family at this point. Yes. Once he shoots, I forgot the guy's name. Once he commits the murder, the, the hit in yeah. the restaurant and he bolts out. He's <laughs> He is in the Colleon crime family from then on. He's made that choice. Yeah. He is in there. Him going to Sicily is now him further going in, further getting, like, delving into his family. He's going to his family's heritage. He's almost, he's almost, I look at it in a sense that he's almost taking this quasi spiritual journey into where the Colleons came from so he can truly be a Colleon. Okay. In that sense. See, I never took it as that. Right. That's how I, and I've only started seeing it through, like, at that point there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because I've got Michael's time in Sicily not only brings him close to his family's heritage, but it also allows him to explore his newfound power. Because he he goes to Sicily and he's almost, he's, no one knows him. He's got, well, no one, he he doesn't have a life in Sicily. He's got a new life in Sicily Mm -hmm. there. He chooses... Right, he's got a taste of power from doing this hit for yeah. for his family. I never looked at it because I said to you before, like I almost uh, initially I looked at him marrying a girl there to um, to all, like it's almost like you just want him to be happy, almost. Yeah. W- yeah. Within my new rewatch, that's not at all what I gained from that. What I gained mm-hmm. from that is. He's testing this. He's not marrying this girl because he loves her. He's marrying her because he can. And he's doing. Yeah. He's doing it because he sees this girl. He fancies her. He's like, oh, she's not bad. Yeah. They immediately see her. Her dad. His two bodyguards are like, we need to go, Michael. And Michael's like, nah. You know what? Let me try this out. And he immediately yeah. goes, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to disrespect you. I want to marry your daughter. Like yeah, instantly, like, there's no connection because okay. because he dropped it in there saying like I'm Michael Colleon, son of the Colleon family. A lot of men would pay a lot of that information costs a lot of money yeah. there, and and he also mentions to the bloke. And what it could cost you is your life. Mm. He basically outright says I'm a powerful guy. You're under me thumb now. Let me marry your daughter. Or you probably will be killed. Yeah, but he says <laughs> like, it. But he says it in a completely calm and almost. It, it's almost like a business transaction. It's not a proposal. Yeah. It's a business. It's. I look at that in the sense that that's Michael already making the decision that when he gets back to America, he's going to be in the crime. He's going to be in the crime business, and this is yeah. almost his excursion, him practicing that way, saying like, "Let's see how much power I can really have. Let's see if I can just marry this random girl just because I can." And he yeah. does. And, I guess, yeah. And it's interesting, like, when I look, when you look at them getting married, there's no love on his face. There's no passion oh, at, no, all, not at all. He doesn't give a no. shit about her. He doesn't care yeah. at all about this girl. And when they eventually have sex, he's not like, well, hey, he's like, yeah, this is exactly what I expected. 
This is exactly. Yeah. He's almost got this look on his face like this is what I deserve because I'm a Coleon. Yeah. And that's and he's he's almost taking this his trip in Sicily. I think it's a very important character building phase for Michael because it's not just him legging it; it's him now investing um, his life of where his father came from and him mm-hmm. trying his look at like, okay, let's see how much I can get out of this in Sicily. And right, I've, okay. and I've also put here is like Sicily is Michael's safety bubble. And once his wife is killed, that's when it's popped. Like he's like, he's al- yeah. like he's almost like in this way of like, ah, you know, shit might be happening in America, but you know what? But I'm Michael. You can't Co- touch me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's when he goes back to America and that's when he's like, okay, marry me. And he immediately tries that with her because he's because mm. he thought, well, it worked with the Italian last. Let, OK, let me. He's being a very manipulative person right away from that point. So that's why I personally think that that's an incredibly okay. important part for Michael. That's yeah, I can see your point. And if I watch it again, I'll try and see it in that way. Yeah. No, yeah. But it's just it's bec- I think it's because of how it was set up in the story. I can understand. It's just like. He's laying low in Sicily, and I was like, okay, but then it keeps going. No, yeah, I and I was like, come, come on, I want to get back to the stuff now. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose in terms of characterization, in terms of the plot, it does not do a lot for me. But in terms of characterization, I guess subconsciously, it is doing a lot for Michael's character without me even realizing. Yeah, and again, I didn't notice um, that. I didn't notice that until my watch last night, and that was I don't even know how many times I've seen the film now. But yeah, it's but that's me actually really analyzing it as well. Like I'm noticing that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think my just another thing. That, like when I said before, which I didn't really want to touch on until um, until we were in spoilers, was the uh, me saying that I thought it ended. Right. Yes. Yes. I I thought this movie ended like four times. Which I think is like, which I don't think helped with me thinking that it was kind of too long. Okay. Because I thought, when when Michael went to kill, went to went to do his hit, mm-hmm. I thought that was the third act, right? So I thought this is gonna happen. We're gonna have a couple more scenes, and it'll finish there. Because I checked Death. when, because I checked when that scene ended. That's an hour forty. So yeah. that's an average film length. Yeah. Yeah, and then I thought, okay. Um, so Sonny's dead now, and when Sonny dies, and that's the point where I was on about about the uh, Bonnie and Clyde death, which it reminded me a lot of that. Which trivia that was directly inspired by that. Francis Ford Coppola said that was directly inspired by the Bonnie and Clyde thing. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. But it, it's yeah, it. I thought it was going to end there because I thought, oh, Sonny's dead, so now Michael takes up the power. Then I thought it was finished again um, at the bit where Carlo was killed. Yes. Which it yeah. kind of does, I guess. That's that's the beginning of the um, wrap up. Yeah, that's when it's like yeah. starting. Yeah. And I also thought it, I also thought the final scene was going to be that bit where Michael and uh, Al Pacino, not Al Pacino, same person, Michael and Don Corleone. When they're talking to each other. Oh, I love that scene so much. And yeah, and Don Corleone's like, oh yeah, you've got to do this, this and this. And Michael's like, I've already took care of it. And all this stuff. Like, I thought that was going to be the last scene because it's passing on the torch. And then it kept going again. And man, I, right. The reason <laughs> I think it was for this is because I was saying to you just before we started recording, I've just been, I've been reading Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Right? Yes, yeah. So, so when I'm watching movies now, just as an exercise, I'm trying to like pick the points that I think are the 15 points in his breakdown the story, story structure. Mm-hmm. If you don't know what that is, he basically Blake Snyder takes it has like a 15 point thing where he's like every story, every movie breaks down into these points uh, and these beats that a story will hit. Yes. And I was trying to identify which parts were the points on that. 15 thing and I was, so, so I could you know map it out yeah, and, yeah. and say oh yeah the, the godfather replies to it and there's so many points when I was like okay so Sonny's death is the all is lost moment I guess but then it wasn't it's almost because there's it's, like it's, another hour it's, but if you look it's almost like Sonny's death and Michael's wife's death that's almost like the all is lost 
point. Yeah. Like that, that, that section there is almost like, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, but I think what made it feel really long for me, and it, it's completely of my own fault, I guess, and I should watch it again, not, not having this in mind, but I was trying to pick out those story beats, and each of those story beats are there, but it takes so long to get to each. Yeah, no, like, definitely, yeah. So, it, like, it made it feel really elongated. I was like, okay, so I know that the next beat is this. I've just got to wait for it. And then I waited for, like, ages to get to it. Okay. And I think that made it feel really long to me. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. No, I can. Which is a, which was a stupid way to look at it. <laughs> um, but in, in my, you know, in my, in my researching of how to write screenplays and stuff, um, I was looking at it in that in that sense, and I probably shouldn't have done. I should be mm. probably looking at it as, am I enjoying this? And the answer is, yeah, probably. <laughs> like, 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 yeah, I'm probably enjoying it a bit. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> you know. Love that. Another thing I want to like uh, mention: what I thought was really cool about this, because again, up until this film, films were mm-hmm. a lot more optimistic in there. Yeah. To, um, even the darker films still had a sense of, I don't know, Hollywood magic to them. Like a lot of Hitch- oh, yeah. like, I, I, you know, Hitchcock films, they're not necessarily optimistic, but there's something about them that feels like, I don't yeah. know, there's some sort of like glamour to it. And like Casablanca, I guess, technically has a bad ending. Exactly, definitely. But yeah. you don't care because it's like, oh, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship or De- whatever. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah that's nice. But, what- but it's not because he just lost the love of his life. Yeah. So. But what I love about The Godfather in this specific moment, and it's relating to a scene that we've already discussed when uh, Michael talks about, is talking to, uh, discusses about how um, how Johnny Fontaine got his... Um, uh, got his yeah. career Sky. I love how he's introduced you're getting all these fan girls just absolutely losing their shit over Johnny Fontaine yeah, yeah. and he's doing his and he's singing a song and as he's singing a song and it, it, immediately that establishes look at look at the familiar glitz and glamour you're familiar with look mm-hmm. at all this this film immediately shows like it's almost I'm not sure if this is meant it's, this was meant to be the case it shows there's a lot darker side to the entertainment world just generally yeah. like, it's like his case like oh, yeah. how did he get successful because again up until that point it was probably like you just need to work hard and you you, you get there yeah. but then immediately michael's like yeah he's in with the mafia that's how mm. he got to that point like it's yeah. it, it's not and i've got another point this film challenges the american dream like it may like, yeah. like it shows like i think it's a really good way of like especially at the end he's successful uh, really at what cost yeah like, exactly. and i think and even a mini commentary on the johnny fontaine situation it's like he's successful and but he still can't get this big movie part so what do they have to do they have to murder the guy's horse yeah like and that's and it just is really like it really sh- i think it's a really it really does a good because ju- that's not that's a familiar thing now within media today they look, we all love to see the darker side of the entertainment world we all love that yeah. these days um, oh, yeah. that's just a natural thing that also happens but I think like, I can't think of an earlier film that did it uh, The Red Shoes kind of did it a little bit in that was 1948 mm-hmm. but not to this extent where it's like yeah murder happens yeah. or like it's a really seedy place in order to get this really nice polished thing yeah in order to get to where you want to be yeah <laughs> you definitely. know shit has to go down definitely and I uh, and again it's like and it, of course films prior to that the first thing that comes musicals did it a lot where it's like ah i'm just a down on my look person and i sing a song like a star is born is the thing that comes to mind yeah yeah. i need to see the originals by the way i i've only seen the new one Um, yeah i've only seen the lady gaga one yeah i i want to see the judy garland one which i do have but that would get to a summit eventually the barbara streisand one (laughs) that was 70s wasn't it i think i have no idea i don't know (laughs) but i but i just like that where immediately like I ne- again i never thought about it. it's like yeah and it's the way that's edited in the sense that he's singing his song people are like losing their mind and off to the mm-hmm. side you're hearing this story about like how he's like that yeah and it's like he's not the role model no and I'm then not. it almost gets you question like are there any are there ever any, any truly perfect role models really no and he's a massive but, pussy right Oh, he's like, a massive when, when, when you yeah. see him talking to talking to Don Corleone, like he, he's a yeah. massive way. Like, fun, you know. fun fact, fun fact: the slap that Marlon Brando gave him was improv. Oh, brilliant! 
the actor didn't expect it to happen. And according to, ja- <laughs> according to, according to James Khan, the actor didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I mean, if Marlon Brando slapped you in the face, I- I'd be the same, to be honest. Like, <laughs> for, also fun little improv. Because I love like hearing little improv stuff. Yeah. There, there's a, you know when Sonny smashed the reporter's camera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah. was improv. That was just a thing just James Khan did. Oh, fuck you, man. Uh, I bet it was all so, the expensive cameras. <laughs> and when he uh, dished the money on the floor as well, that was improv as well. Just cause, And James Caan oh, outright said... Because yeah. James Caan said, like, where he came from, uh, you were taught you had to repair or repay something you damaged. So I just right. love that little thing of, like, tsh, here. Yeah, <laughs> I, li- I liked that when I saw it. Also, yeah. here's a fun thing that I noticed, which is so obvious now that I think about it, but I didn't, I didn't know any of the characters in this movie except Don Corleone. Mm-hmm. Um the the like mobsters in The Simpsons, Fat Tony and that. Oh, right. Yeah. Is like henchman is so obviously Sonny from oh, The yeah. Godfather. Like I didn't I never even thought about it, but yeah, I was like, wait, I I noticed it like halfway through, I was like, Oh yeah, he's so obviously based on Sonny from The Godfather, isn't he? Oh yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You can see it's this is what I mean about it though, is it, it being a film that you have to see. Like it's just it's ripples throughout entertainment. It's ingrained. Like, it's it's ingrained in, cul- in culture. Exactly. Not even entertainment in culture. Yeah. Like, it, like it's just yeah. And, uh, and another one little improv thing as well. I do want to throw in there the mm-hmm. the the big improv bit. Um, when I forgot the guy's name, when they drive out to the field, the yes. the big the big bloke goes out to take a piss. The oh, guy yeah, gets yeah. shot. Yeah. The guy gets shot. He goes over and he goes, uh, leave the gun, take the cannolis. The take the cannolis was an improv line. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just... It, but I also, because that's, that's that adds a little bit of humour to... And that's another thing. As kind of grim as the film is, there's humour in this oh, film. it's funny. This that, fun. Again, that, we, we had a laugh about Luca Brasi just being an absolute <laughs> bumbling mess. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the one of the bits that really got me, it was like a fucking Home Alone style thing. The horse's bed, the horse in his bed, mm-hmm. like it, it, he screams, and then it, oh, and then it exactly. pulls out of the, and it pulls out and shows the big wide shot of the house, and you can still hear the scream. And I was like, that's, that's just a bit in Home Alone where he does the aftershave. That's, that's exactly what that is. I, I was laughing. I was like, that was so funny. I mean, it's horrible, oh, obviously. It's, oh, it's grim. It's real funny. <laughs> oh God, yeah, exactly, definitely. Yeah, man. But um. It, one thing I also wa- I wanted to uh, point out that what I re- what I realized the dawn on his death on death's door causes as much chaos as a nation's leader resigning, it's, which is one thing I've realized. Mm. Like it's like imagine like if like I mean how you mentioned before how like um, to me like how in the thick of it when just like a prime minister just resigned and everyone just was like, what, what do we do? It's, yeah. all, it's, it's almost that equivalent where like, he's going to die and everyone's like, what the fuck? What's how do, and it's like, they're thinking instantly, like, are we even going to survive? Yeah. Which other families are going to be coming after us now? Mm-hmm. We, and at that point, mafia, their whole thing was like, they, they almost like put their shares in different businesses. Yeah. So they're like, who have we got? Who have we got? And it's like, Right, we got the newspaper people, but who else is it? It's it's yeah. like they're almost it's almost like a big business decision as opposed to as well as like me dad's might be dying. It's like the business might be fucked. Oh yeah. And, 100%. Un- and unlike and unlike um certain things where it's like the business might be fucked. Oh well that means that we might have to close the shop. Their business being screwed might be like we might get shot in the head. Yeah. We oh, might yeah. get gunned down. Because of this, and I like, I just found that really interesting. Like, yeah, the film has a heavy family theme, mm-hmm. but it's a, but it's a quite a business film as well. Almost, it oh, really yeah. is quite like, it yeah. really does lean into the political side of things as well, which I, I, I was fascinated by. Yeah, I think here's another bit, right, that I just thought of then, um, for bits that I don't understand why they're in there, and I'd like you to explain your your take on this. Okay. Um, the whole thing with Tommy being like the other family is like oh to- um Tom Hagen do you mean yeah Robert Duvall yeah 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 when he's ta- when he's taken to the other family and they're all like you're gonna convince Sonny to to do this or whatever N- nothing mm. nothing comes of it it just kind of adds 
kind of fake stakes to the story that no, nothing I, ever comes of. Yeah, no, that... I think that's a way to introduce... Is it Clemenza? Is that the guy's name? I, I honestly cannot remember. For, I think... yeah, for It's not... It's not Barzini, because Barzini's kind of like the... the He's big, the big one, like, yeah. at the end, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I think it is Clemenza. That's the guy who Michael kills at the restaurant. Yeah. I think that's... Because when that scene came up, I forgot about it. I was like... And I've seen the film so many times, and every yeah. time I don't, I don't remember that scene. Because in my mind, it's like... I always imagine, right, the Don gets shot. Mm-hmm. Everyone loses this shit. I was like, what do we do? And then... Michael gets punched in the face, yeah, and then they plan to kill. The guy. That's where my, that's where I track, yeah. in my memory, and I and I I don't have any. I can't say what the relevance of that specific. Yeah, shot is. like if you yeah, if, what that scene is. If so. they just want a villain introduction, like just write it another way instead of just randomly doing this thing that never gets brought up again. No, I do agree that they probably could not have just had that in there, and we could yeah. have just known. We could like, we didn't need a big. We could have seen Clemenza first in the taxi. Yeah. When my I I agree. I, I think agree. I think it's just like God, I'm gonna get so much hate for saying this. Right. I think it could just the script generally and just the story and everything, it could just do with being streamlined a little bit. Okay. I think is my take on it. But I need to watch it again in a okay. new light. In a not looking at it structurally and Yeah. Trying to find those story beats and stuff because it's it's not gonna help me at all. <laughs> Nah, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a scene that like, I, it just doesn't do anything. Like there's yeah. nothing to it really that sticks out to me. Um, uh, here's a few things like little like character beats that I've no- that I noticed when watching this specifically. Go on. When Michael begins uh, talking family business, when he s- begins to start talking about the thought of saying that he would kill uh, mm-hmm. Clemenza and the uh, the police officer. Yeah. After he's got punched, and they're talking about what do we do and all that shit. Yeah. He sat. That's the very first time that he sat in the way that he would sit when he eventually becomes the leader of the family. That's the first time where his posture is changed. He sat yeah. upright. His legs are crossed, and his arms are on the arms of the chair. That's the very first. So that's mm. almost like that's the first peak of when he becomes the don. That's like a nice that's little him. thing, right? That's, and I noticed, and I need to talk about a scene specifically because mm-hmm. the blocking of this scene is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And since research, doing more research on directing, I've really, I really look out for blocking now and yeah. like placements of people. Mm-hmm. It's the scene where um, they're talking about um, going to the going to buy out um, Mo Green. Okay. And they're in. They're in a uh, Vito's office. It's the it's the time when Vito is finally off his feet, on his feet a bit more. Yeah, he's in his. He, he's no longer dressed like Don Vito Colleone. He's dressed like Grandad Vito, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. And it starts off with him like stood stood behind the desk, like mm-hmm. talking, and then that's and then as soon as he says Michael is now, like I'm still the Don, but Michael is. Taking care you know, of business, basically. Yeah, he yeah. he's basically going to be the head due to due to <laughs> Santino's demise. And yeah, all that. brilliant. Well done, yeah. man. That was fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hate my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and it, and he says like, ah, oh, like Michael's now taking care of it, and then we see Michael sat in the corner again, sat in how he would be sat. Yeah, and he's and the lamp is positioned behind him, and he's the most lit person in that room. Yeah, which again, I see little things like that. I'm like that's fucking rad. Yeah. and then like as soon as, and then when Michael starts really getting in and explaining specific roles of what's going to happen, mm-hmm. v- Vito moves away from the desk to prepare some drinks. Yes, uh, Michael stands up, and then he starts walking behind the desk. Mm-hmm. Like he starts w- almost showing like, right, this is where I'm at now. And yeah. then as soon as he finishes speaking, that's when Michael sits down behind the desk and then Vito sits um, to the side. Yeah. that is, Yeah, that is good. And, and again, it's stuff that I just, it's visually telling you 
V2 is now no longer in power. Michael now is. And also, yeah. I'm, not sure if this was, I'm not sure if this was actually intentional or if it just happened anyway. Just like the shot of when Michael is sat on the desk, just like leaning back on the chair and he's like putting out his cigarette in the ashtray. I look mm. at that in the sense of like, oh, now he's marking his territory almost. Yeah. I could be looking too deep into that, but it's it no, just... There's, it's, there's parts of that character arc that you really can go in deep with. Yeah, no. and there's obviously also an obvious thing again. Not sure how intentional it is. You can see Michael's transformation through literally his hair, and it's weird to say this. Yeah, when all the time you see him, he's got um his hair kind of like how you've got it, where it's like he's you know just a bit you know not where it's amazing and beautiful yeah. is what you mean. Nice <laughs> and nice casual hairstyle. Thanks. Man. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know like uh, of course this is audio so i need to explain with like a fringe down and yeah, you know, just yeah. a bit a bit more a bit more almost associated with um naivety i guess is the way to say because when yeah. you're a child you, you know, I'd, I'd, i would yeah i would yeah. second that <laughs> so and whenever he becomes more quote-unquote mafioso like yeah. his hair begins to be more slicked back which yeah. is more associated with Greases and all that kind of thing. Yeah, and again, it's an obvious thing. That's like a thing that I think I noticed first time I watched it. You can see it instantly. Where it's like his hair's like this, and he literally changes his appearance. Yeah, like, but it's it, again, it's like small things like that. Like I just like find really interesting. And the only time his hair is back down amidst his whole reign mm-hmm. is the one time is in Sicily when he's dancing with his wife, and it's the one time he looks like he's. Yeah. Like genuinely enjoying himself. Yeah. Or like having some genuine moments. Like a human moment. Yeah. Kind of and, yeah. And which is more interesting because when I think to Godfather 2, I don't think he ever has his hair back to being quite as casual as it ever is. Okay. Which again, it's little things like that. And I yeah. think it's, but you know, it's that, that's what filming it, that it's intentional. Like, I don't think yeah. anything. Like, There's things you know, where you like look at it and, you know, people don't realize how intentional things in filmmaking is. Yeah. But there's those little bits where it's like, and it, it, it speaks to people. Yeah. And even and if they don't notice. You yeah. Do. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but once we got, uh, we had that lesson in script, Ryan, about mise-en-scene, I just immediately yeah. started looking into mise-en-scene. Yeah. Like I yeah. just start like really like looking in like every, like again, example, the oranges, there's a reason why they're there. Yeah, exactly. It's to, it's, it's to be like, yeah, this is going to happen. And Something like, bad's going to happen. Watch yeah, out. exactly. Watch out. Oh, oh, uh. no. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll get through some of my other points and then we can get, you know, more into certain things Cool. as well. One other thing I want to say is the scene that we were talking about where Vito's talking to Michael towards the end, yeah. just one to one. I love how Vito is disappointed that Michael took uh, on the role. Yeah. And not because he's like, I think you're shit. He's like, you, you you're were like... Than it. Yeah, you were like, you were yeah. the one, but you could have been like, but he's like, but what else, what else could we have done? Yeah. Sonny's, Sonny is dead. Tom can't do it because Tom isn't blood. Yeah. And they were like, and Connie can't do it because she's a woman. It's like mm. that. And, and he's like, and Fredo, who, who the f- why would I let Fredo do it? Yeah. Like that was, even though Fredo's older than, uh, I think he's the oldest. I think that's, yeah, I, I think, think so, Fredo. Yeah. Yeah, Fre- yeah, Fredo's the oldest, but he's like, and I, Michael's the youngest, I think. Or is mm-hmm. it Connie? I think Con- I can't remember. It's one of the two. Yeah. Uh, but I love the fact how it's like how Vo is like you could have, you 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 were a, you went you were a war hero, you were yeah. something you ha- you were out. It's you almost like he was ashamed of it. Like he's ashamed yeah. of where they get their money from, and he's like, you you could have broken the cycle, sort of thing. Which is kind of what I like, and like throughout the entire film, I think the character of Vito Corleone is very sincere. Yeah, he's a very he's he's never he's never mali- There's that one time where he slaps him, mm-hmm. where he slaps Johnny Fontaine, but that's like, mate, stop being a little. Yeah, it's like get yourself together, sort of slap. But also, I like to think about that. Like that's the Corleone temper coming out in yeah, a sense. Again, yeah, but it's almost like he's always like, he loves his family. He <laughs> he never does anything dirty himself i think at that point he's earned his right not to do it though he's like well yeah. why should i do that i can get other people to do it for me yeah but he's he's always be, it's like when Sonny died and he's like devastated 
oh, not yeah. like got he's not got this hard like demeanor because even like when Michael finds out about it, he's a bit like oh, he's almost cold to it almost, mm-hmm. and he, and even Tom Tom Hagen he's quite like emotional about it, but he's like keeping himself together. Yeah. But as soon as Vito hears about it, he's just in tears. In, yeah, he like breaks down. Yeah, completely. and he and he and that scene and again you can say that this scene can get thrown away um in the funeral parlor but i think mm-hmm. this is probably the best part i mean one of the two best parts of vo of brando's acting as vo yeah. when he say when he's saying i don't want my boy to look i don't want his mother i don't to want to see him like this yeah i don't i don't want my boy to look like this yeah because that's another line that i knew from the movie yeah. oh, that's right, one of okay. the only other ones that i knew was the whole like Look how they massacred my boy thing. I would do the voice, but I won't. Yeah, okay, that's fair. <laughs> Just yeah. out of embarrassment. But like, yeah, that that whole thing of look how they massacred my boy. I knew about that. Interesting. I don't know how or why. Yeah, because that's not like. No, it, it's not like a big moment. It's no, probably but... been like referenced on fucking Family Guy or something. That's been probably. Like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, but I know. I just love like, it's that moment and the moment when he's with his grandson towards the end. Yeah. That is one that of my death fifth, scene that's... is awful, you know. What do you it's, mean? It, no, not awful as in it's bad. Oh, I mean, oh it's right, like, okay, it's right. real sad. Oh, it's devastating because the kid doesn't it's... know what happened. Oh, I, oh, I, 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 I got, I got, gen- I got genuinely emotional last night. I <laughs> yeah. was like, oh no. Yeah, because the kid no. just keeps shooting him with the water pistol. He's just laughing and he's like, yeah. Oh, I don't. Uh, it, it, it real that really got me. It, it's the fall as well. It's not a Hollywood fall. That's a bad fall. Oh, goes, yeah, Poof. 100%. It's, it, he doesn't fall glamorously as well. He's like in a crumple. It's, yeah, it, it's, no, it's, it's, it's a pathetic death, but not really. Do you know no, what I mean? Uh, yeah, and it's. I kind of like that that's how Don Vito Colleon goes, though. I don't. Yeah. I kind of like how he's he survives a hit. And then and goes out on like a heart attack sort a of A heart thing. attack. But he goes out being a grandfather. Yeah, not play, being a monster. Play, yeah, playing with his son, yeah. playing with his grandson. I don't know. It's it shows it shows um a, a lot of genuineness yeah. to it. As There's well. kind it's of the, a thought of like they can rise above being just this these criminals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like um, it's uh, it's the bit where he puts like the orange peel in his mouth and he's got like he's trying he's <laughs> pretending to be. I, know, it's, it, I yeah. saw that. I was like, that's a proper granddad thing. Yeah, it is that's as just well. a pr- that's just a proper like. Uh, and then the kid's like, oh, it's like no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Calm it's down. just me. It's just me. It's just me. Your stupid granddad with orange peel in his mouth. <laughs> Don't even worry about it, kid. It's fine. <laughs> Come on, let's run around and let me fall over in the oranges because oranges are the equal to death, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, SpongeBob. This is a weird reference to make. Evil, <laughs> every villain is lemons, and yes. they like make lemons out to be the villain. Yeah, I'm telling yeah. you, it's oranges all along, mate. It's a different citrus fruit. And one thing, <laughs> oh god, but I—that's a genuine thing that I love about that about that specific uh, point of uh, the character of Vito Colleon. Yeah, and one last thing I do want to say, okay, um, about my notes, mm-hmm. and then we can have a bit more of a free flow with it, yeah, to an extent, um, or any last or any other additional things we feel like we want to discuss with it. Cool. What I find very interesting is that um, it's the um, and this might get a bit political, by the way, so I just want to warn you. Okay. Um, yeah. As, I'm, I'm as, po- as, so right. Right. As political as I can get. Okay. So just think about that. Like, right, I'm not yeah, gonna. Yeah, get, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm a bit more at ease now. <laughs> yeah. It's a, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, when Michael is talking to Kay for the first time since he's well, it's not since he's been back from Sicily. It's like it's like how long have you been here? I've been here for a year. Like a, like a been year. Here for, been here for over a year. And she's like, oh, I like Michael. Oh, Come boss on. move, man. <laughs> what a boss ass move that is it's like that's when he decided you know what I kind of want to get laid again yeah <laughs> and, he, Ball on it. <laughs> and he's like it's like Kay I want you to marry me and she's like no Michael he goes yeah away come on Yeah. Go, he, he, go, he, go he basically on. said that, he basically went away <laughs> yeah she was like no I won't marry him he was like don't be daft come on he went oh <laughs> look at me don't be he, went, he went look at me look at my coat look at my fedora look, look at my me look at my cool slick back hair <laughs> 
I love it. But there's the bit where um, look at these um, oranges. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> She brings a fruit ball over yeah, with some origins, and Michael, Michael's like, "Get that out! Get, Get that away from me! <laughs> Not like this!" He like drop kicks the orange out of the fucking window or something. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, yeah, I was on. trying to get onto a serious point, and we somehow delved onto Michael Collion fi- fighting an orange. <laughs> no, go um, on, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was me as well. Oh, that's what you gosh. get. That's what you get with the intermission podcast. What I want to add. Um, that's what you're gonna get with this podcast. <laughs> I want to add. Um, it's when they're talking, and then um, I, I need to bring up the actual quote because I can't do it justice with just a simple. Um, okay. Me, because I've briefly written it, but I need to like actually get up the quote itself. It's when they're talking about um, when Michael's saying, "Yeah, I'm like in the business now," and she's like, "I thought you didn't want to do that and all that mm-hmm. stuff." And and Michael says, "My father is no different," because that's right. She says, "Uh, I thought you didn't want to be like your father." To which Michael yeah. says, "My father is no different than any powerful man, any man with power, like a president or a senator." K replies with do you know how naive you sound michael presidents and senators don't have men killed michael then goes oh who's being naive kate what i and what i think about that's not just coppola being like yeah let me let let me be a little bit political here Mm. that i look at that in a sense of michael was uh he fought in the military yeah he he now looks at it in a set, so he's not unfamiliar with killing prior to um, being uh, a mobster, being a being in the mafia. He's yeah. not. That's not a. It's not like he was a lawyer, and then his then he all of a sudden killed. He already had this, like yeah. kind of like he, he he's familiar with murder. Yeah, I think that Michael at that point, looks at it in a sense of like, well, I was a hitman and the president was a big mafia boss and all I was doing, I was simply acting out a, a mission for my original crime yeah. lord. And now, cause, and, and now he's trying to make that into a thing about... Um, I, I, I think he puts that together in the sense of like, no, because we get told we need to fight this war, but why? Because a couple of politicians are disagreeing. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent of two crime families disagreeing and then all out gang war breaks out. Yeah. So I think that that's where Michael starts looking at it in that sense. Like I've already done it, but I've done it in a more, in a way, in a way that's more publicly looked upon like a socially That's accepted way right. yeah, yeah yeah it's like i'm a war hero even like i kill people for the military i'm a war hero i kill people for my family i'm a criminal mm-hmm. like, and and to yeah. that he almost might look at that and go but which one do i really care about the country tried to the country tries to put my family down but my family tries to build each other but up again So I think at that point, that almost like makes it more of like a link. That makes it more of a natural link for Michael to go from this to this. Because again, as I said, if he was like a teacher, like you might look at that and go like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, that's the thing in um, in Save the Cat, to go back to that, just the whole thing about make your hero the perfect hero for that story. And I think like that's pretty like that's pretty evident there with michael because it, i mean they put the it says to make it the perfect hero for the story in the sense that he would be the character that would have the most development over mm-hmm. that and that's like and that it makes sense and all that kind of stuff and that it, him being a soldier and having that you know that that history with like war and killing and all that kind of stuff it's perfect mm-hmm. it's like it's it's perfect set up for a guy who would try and convince himself that it's okay by the end of yeah. that movie it's yeah oh yeah really well chosen job because like, i mean you don't really you know if if he was just like a guy and said oh yeah i'm not really into the whole family it would yeah. it would work the same but just that by saying he was a war hero adds just yeah. another layer on top of it of being like oh yeah that's pretty 
that's good shit you know yeah because you also know you see it's all again it's perfect karen introductions what well. he's in his military outfit mm-hmm. you don't need him to say it's i mean our our uh one of our lecturers would love this. It's yeah. the perfect. It's perfectly show and not tell. There's li- yeah. there's no there's no tell with it. It's not like they go, Michael, you did this, didn't you? It's like he shows up. He's in, in a his military uniform. Yeah, and he's very much so. And they say like when the like when the police officer punches him in the face, they go, Ah, oh, he's a war hero. He's fine. Yeah. Like he's a, he's a model citizen. That's what they go. Ah, oh, he's fine. He doesn't he doesn't do. He's a he's a war hero, hmm. but he's not saying that to be like. Let me tell you about Michael Corleone. He's saying that like, why do I need to cuff him? Come on, he's fine. Yeah, and it's almost like you see it in his. He's not just. I'm a moody guy. It's almost like, in when you first see Michael, you can see it in his face. It's like, oh, he's seen shit. Oh, hundred percent. And and you can tell. Oh, he's done stuff. Mm. Like you can see it, he's got this like almost regret. Like he's almost got regret in his face anyway. Yeah, and it's almost like it, it could almost be looked at upon like he felt alive at war and he's back home doing nothing. And then once he then gets that taste of killing again, that's when he's like, "No, this is where I should belong." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, because it takes place where 1945 is where we pick up. The war's done at that point. Yeah, it's just after so the it's, Second World War. Yeah. So he might almost be, peri- like looking. Uh, for this phase of like what can I do that's also this but I can't mm. be in the war again and he's like my family does this yeah maybe that's some like so it's like I think it's just really clever stuff like and they didn't say that they didn't say that's why Michael's joining the crime stuff, family you can just infer it from from really really solid characterization in the script yeah you know to yeah. which but here we are talking about that mm-hmm. and we get that from that I just think that's like fantastic storytelling oh yeah overall. and it's all and it's also Pacino's incredible acting in it as well like it's subtle it's a subtle performance but, but it's it's good it's really like it's, he, he was easily the standout for me I've always thought that I've always thought that yeah with these, yeah definitely yeah no certainly is there anything else you would want to discuss about uh the Godfather in its in a spoilery way um not really that I can think of. Like I'm just okay. I'm excited after seeing it and discussing mm-hmm. it more in depth with you now. Mm-hmm. I'm more excited than after I first finished it now to watch the second one. Because, I mean, yeah. by by all accounts, all I've heard is that the second one's the best one. Right, that's and, the thing. And the third one, don't bother. I'll yeah, watch it one. anyway. But that's fine. I've heard <laughs> it's not great. Yeah, it's is what it is, really. The second, like, there's two different. There's two, like, you're either someone who really who loves the first, who prefers the first one, mm-hmm. or who prefers the second one. I personally prefer the first one, yeah. but I've seen the first one more, and I've seen the second one once. Yeah, but I think I just personally, I remember more from the first. But there's one story element which I'm not going to say because it's a massive spoiler. Okay. But there's what there's one story element in two which I fucking love like it includes maybe Pacino's best part of acting ever I think maybe right like, okay there's what there's and I can see the shot in my mind and I'm like that it I, I'm getting like goosebumps thinking about it like it's yeah. genuinely a fucking good thing and again not going to say anything more about it because obviously big spoilers yeah but it's yeah right one thing I want to do now if that's all we have to really discuss about the film, mm-hmm. I want to do a little bit of fun and read some trivia because I always like that. I always like looking looking up some stuff. Um, here's the thing: uh, there was intense friction. I get all this from IMDb, by the way. Just want to point that out there. I'm not. Like, this is where I'm pulling it from. Yeah. Uh, there was intense friction between Coppola and Paramount Pictures in which Paramount Pictures frequently try- tried to have Coppola replaced, citing his inability to stay on schedule, unnecessary expenses, and production and casting errors. Coppola actually completed the film ahead of schedule and under budget. <laughs> <laughs> which is some, which is something that maybe can't be said for Apocalypse Now. But there yeah, we go. another film I haven't seen. I want to talk I'll about probably something need to like watch that now. later. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, another fun little fact. Mm-hmm. 
An, a note to the attention of detail. Yes. Okay. Most of the cars have wooden bumpers. Bumpers were removed by car owners during World War II and replaced with wooden ones. The chrome ones were turned in to help with the war effort. After the war, it took several years for them to be replaced. So that's why in the film there's just a load of cars with wooden bumpers. That's really good stuff, that. That's a nice little thing. I look like, and I think I forgot who said it. Was it? I, was it in uni? I can't remember if it was in uni, mm-hmm. or if I just no, it wasn't in uni. I think I just heard about this in someone discussing. It might be in uni. I can't remember how. Um, they how someone like a there was a film that was taking place during a certain period of yeah. time, and there was like um, metal pipes, obviously that we have now in terms of drain yeah. pipes. But apparently, there's a production design. No, it wasn't in uni. I did it for uni research. That's right, where this okay. came from. It's it's when I was researching mise on set and set and set design and stuff mm-hmm. like that. There was a set designer who's specifically there to make sure like everything and is right to the time period. Right. Even so much so to the point where like there's a certain metal a certain metal that wasn't around in that time period. Mm-hmm. So they they were like, right, we can't have that there. We need this metal. <laughs> but it's a thing that you would ne- we would never notice. Yeah, you'd never think but of it. But if that was in but if in that was if it was in that time period, we would think there's some. It just doesn't look right, but we wouldn't know yeah. why. But so I just find little things like that fun. It's like I didn't even notice the bumpers. No, I, I didn't. But that, but like that's but that makes that's, sense. Yeah, it's a cool little thing. Yeah, here's a bit more of a interesting fact idea. Orson Welles mm. lobbied to get the part of Don Vito Corleone even offering to lose a good amount of weight in order to get the role. Coppola, a Wells fan, had to turn him down because he already had Brando in mind for the role and felt Wells wouldn't be right for it. That's very strange. I can kind of see yeah, it. Yeah, I can kind of see also... it. But yeah, I just find that, like the fact that Orson Wells was really trying to get the part of Vito Corleone. I, yeah, I can see that. I can... But I also like Brad. I I think Brando did yeah. fine in it as well. I think Brando. He's did. okay. Also, maybe Orson Welles wouldn't have had a stupid voice. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, don't know. know man. <laughs> but it wasn't in the trivia. But this is something I naturally know. Mm-hmm. Jack Nicholson was offered the role of Michael Corleone initially, right? I can say that. Nich- Nicholson turned it down because he felt the role should have went to an Italian American. Cool. Which I what agree because. Imagine just his white Jack Nicholson yeah. as Michael Corleone. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, well that'll be yeah. something that the studio was lobbying for. Or... I don't know. I, it might have been Paramount because what did he do at that point? I, I think he was still relevant. You, he did Easy Rider. Nicholson was an Easy Rider, right. and he got nominated for supporting actor for Easy Rider. Right, that makes sense. Which is stray. Which which is a strange nomination. I want to add. You'll understand when you see okay. Easy Rider, eventually, but. But yeah, but Nicholson probably blew up because of Easy Rider and they were like, get yeah. him, get him for Michael. Because he was a young actor at the time as well and they were like, yeah, probably just yeah. wanted him in it. I think he's a similar age to Pacino as well, so... There's, there's points yeah. in that movie where Pacino really looks like Dustin Hoffman. I can Do you know what I mean? That. Like my dad, my I, dad was yeah. like, there was a point where we paused it because my mum came in and just started talking about whatever. And we, we paused it for a bit. Uh, and my dad just like looked at him and went, that don't look like Pacino at all, does it? And I was like, yeah. no, no, actually, not really. He kind of looks like Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. God, that's an actor that I still love, but he's a bit shady now, isn't he? Yeah, it's not great. <laughs> the, gr- the, gr- the Graduate, though, top shit. Really I've good got stuff. that on DVD. Real good stuff. Mate. Right, so we got many many stuff to talk about for this podcast at some point but yeah uh, but yeah right coppola insisted on the film being called mario puzo's godfather rather than just the godfather Mm -hmm. because his original draft of the screenplay was so faithful to the novel um he thought puzo deserved the credit for it which is cool stuff i Um, guess that was before the, uh, the like you get story by now don't you as a credit yeah, but Puzo was also um, the writer on the film. Wasn't credit it? is he was co-writer on yeah. the film as well. Fun fact as well: Mario Puzo wrote the screenplay for the first Superman film. Brilliant! 
That one, as you can imagine, I have seen. <laughs> yes. And I love with all my heart. I haven't seen that one. I, seen... I, I love those original Superman movies. And Brando's in them. Brando is Jor-El. <laughs> Here's a thing. Brand- I watched the opening credits for that film, mm-hmm. for Superman 78. Yeah. Brando's the first name. Oh, uh, yeah. I could, yeah. It goes It goes Brando, Gene Hackman, then Superman, then Christopher Reeve. <laughs> yeah, of course it does. <laughs> no, like, no one it. cared at that point who Christopher Reeve was. <laughs> no. <laughs> Back to the Godfather. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the- Rest in peace. The- the early buzz, the early buzz on this movie was so positive that a sequel was planned before the film was even finished. That's stuff that you only hear of now. Man, that's that, yeah. Like that, that yeah, stuff that crazy. you hear of the superhero movies and stuff, where it's like, oh yeah, yeah. have you heard this new X Men movie so good that they're planning a spin off already based on this character? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, right, exactly. Fine, I'll wait till it's out. Because they did that I will- for Fantastic. It yeah, was like, the early buzz is like, it's so good, they've already planned a sequel and all this. And I was like, mm, it's not mm, though, is it? Yeah. <laughs> right. This one's going to be interesting for you, Robin. Yeah, go on. Talking about the, the length of time. Mm-hmm. Fran- Francis Ford Coppola turned in an initial director's cut running at two hours and six minutes. Yeah. Paramount, Paramount Pictures production chief Robert Evans rejected this version and demanded a longer cut with more scenes about the family. The final release version was nearly 50 minutes longer than Coppola's initial cut. So... I'm right. <laughs> so I'm right. So everyone can't shout at me because Coppola agrees. <laughs> I want to see that. I, I want to see that director's cut. The, the two-hour yeah. cut. That's interesting. I don't know, because I think about The Godfather as an epic crime film. I don't know if I could like yeah. look at it as just a two-hour crime film. I don't know. Again, I like stuff in there, but that's interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. That's the case. Because usually you hear, because usually you hear about studios being like, "Cut it down." Yeah, I'm. I'm glad that that is a thing that exists in the world, and I would love to see it. (laughs) Uh, Stanley, uh, release the Coppola. Release the (laughs) Coppola. Get it hashtagging or whatever it is. Trending. No. Oh God. Trend. Why did I sound like a forty-five-year-old man then? I was get gonna, it. I was gonna say, Robbie, Robbie, you're nineteen. Get it, that just be- Jesus Christ? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, Stanley Kubrick thought the film had the best cast ever and could be the best movie ever made. No, that's that's nice. Thanks, yeah. Stan. You don't you don't hear about Kubrick really praising stuff that often, no. do you? So don't uh, even pra- uh, praise on performances. You don't <laughs> Here's the thing about uh, Frank Sinatra and Johnny Fontaine that I was going to that Go I on. talked about earlier. According to according to Mario Puzo, the character of Johnny Fontaine was not based on Frank Sinatra. Mm-hmm. However, it was widely assumed that it was and Sinatra was furious when he met Pu- when he met Puzo at a restaurant, he screamed vulgar terms and threats at Puzo. Sinatra was also uh, opposed to the film. Due to this backlash, Fontaine's role in the film was scaled down to a couple of scenes. Wow. Yeah. That's really intriguing. I, I love hearing things like that, though. I, we all know rumours about um, Sinatra being in the pocket of the mob. Yes. And uh, I haven't looked into it that in depth, so I, I, I want to, though. I want to like investigate yeah. that whole thing more anyway. But the fact that he kicked off a Puzo, I think there's something there. He got a bit defensive. Yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> like, like hearing the stories about actors and thing, and just like famous people shouting at each other in restaurants. Like there was the thing about um, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey. Mm, and yeah. Tommy Lee Jones just like said to him really calmly and collectively, just, I hate you. Like, I hate you <laughs> so much. And that was like just after they'd done Batman Forever. Brilliant. Yeah. It's so oh, funny. Mental. Like that, that's fucking right. brilliant. Here's something that I think you would really appreciate. The montage of crime scene photos and headlines about the war between the five families. Yeah, the before film. it goes to Sicily. The, the mattress sequence, as it's apparently called, okay. was, put together by jo- was put together by George Lucas <gasps> as, as a favour to Francis Ford Coppola for helping him fund American graffiti. No he way. asked not he asked not to be credited. Lucas used photos from real crime scenes. Uh, the one pictured is Frank Nitti, aka the Enforcer, Al Capone's right hand man, who had not been murdered but actually shot himself during the scene. 
Uh, during the scene, Coppola's father, Carmine, is the piano player. So Lucas put together that scene for Coppola. Oh, that's cool, that's me. The, yeah. the light of my life, do, George Lucas. Do you know, because that makes a lot more sense, because do you know of Lucas's uh, college project? College film yeah, it's THX. Yeah, with that really, no, the the his film that he did for universe, for film school. He did like this kind of like, cool animated not quite animated mm. but this really like inventive way of like flashes of images and different like it's really inventive way of editing especially for the 60s right, okay. and i think it's on youtube somewhere it's less than five minutes but that got like him big claim for like mm -hmm. i think that got him big acclaim for when he submitted it for like competitions and stuff but yeah. but knowing that now that make that matches up with that, and I think that's really cool. That oh, yeah. Lucas did a section in The Godfather. That is cool. I would I wouldn't have known that because probably out of the four of them, out of Coppola, Scorsese, Spielberg, and Lucas, Lucas I think was the more like techie and the more like hey let oh, me do 100%. all this stuff. You can tell just from his what he wanted to do with Star Wars and stuff like that. You know, you can uh, tell like he was the more. I think it. Because I think he was well, I think he was well into his cars as well. Like oh, he loved yeah. like the mechanicus. Well, and, American and Graffiti like is like highly based on his own childhood. Gra oh, I still need to see American. Oh, when you talk about American, I still see it. Yeah, I, I've got I've got that on DVD, so there's definitely some of that I wouldn't mind discussing. Yeah, cool. At some definitely. Point. Um, the scenes of Michael and Ke this is something that we can relate to, mm -hmm. right, Robbie? Not directly, but to an extent. Yes. The, the scenes of Michael and Kay at the wedding at the beginning were shot at night due to the rushed schedule. Francis Ford Coppola had to get their scenes in the bag. Cinematographer Gordon Willis was furious at having to rig up so many lights. <laughs> so even then... <laughs> so even then... Even back in the 70s, lighting was the fucking worst. <laughs> and I read that bit and I just... I saw me talking to Jack. Yeah. <laughs> You can just see Jack stood there holding a light. Like this. Can, like, we, can we just say action, please? And I've just imagined Gordon Willis just holding like a fucking light, just like, oh, God's sake, I hate this, Francis. Why do we need to? God fucking damn it, Francis. That oh is so funny. That yeah. light, lighting was even a bitch then. I've been trying to research it whilst we've been in lockdown, and I've just there's there's no good like. No tutorials or anything no. on how to get good lighting because they're like, oh, it just depends on the scene and the three yeah. point lighting and, blah, 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 blah. and it's like, yeah, but it doesn't apply. It never applies. Yeah, it's so part of me. That's I start looking at films and I actually start looking at the light and I'm like, is it really that good or am I just thinking it's really fucking good? Yeah. And I'm like, nah, it's actually quite underlit so they, and it looks fine. So maybe I need to take that into consideration. <laughs> maybe we just like, need to calm down. Yeah, maybe we should not be so perfectionist with lighting. <laughs> but yeah. Um, one of the reasons why Francis Ford Coppola finally agreed to direct the film mm -hmm. was because he was in debt to Warner Brothers following $400,000 budget overruns on George Lucas's THX 1138. Mm -hmm. And Lucas urged him to take the job for The Godfather. Brilliant. So yeah, thanks exactly. George Lucas. We have we have to thank George Lucas for more of this than we thought. Yeah, exactly. Like he did quite a lot in there. Oh god, really. uh, what a lad! What a lad. Um, <laughs> I love you, George. This uh, Francis Ford Coppola worked with relatives in this film, making it a family film in many contexts. Of course, being the mafia and stuff, it's a horribly yeah. family contingent thing. In chronological order of appearance, his sister Talia Shire, which I didn't realize they were siblings mm -hmm. uh portrayed connie throughout this throughout the whole trilogy i didn't so, know that neither i know the coppola's a big family because nicholas cage is the nephew of francis Ford coppola yeah yeah that's, which that's is crazy to me um his mother um it, italia coppola served as an extra in the restaurant meeting mm -hmm. uh his father carmine coppola was the piano pe player which we've yeah said there um uh, his sons, uh, Giancarlo Coppola and Roman Coppola, can be seen as extras in the scene where Sonny beats up Carlo. Right. Ro Roman Coppola is a often collaborator with Wes Anderson. Mm -hmm. That's what, yeah, so that's a fun little fact there. Um, and he is at the funeral, uh, and his daughter, Sophia Coppola, is the baby, uh, which, because she would have been one 
when that yeah. was filmed. So Sofia Coppola was She's the baby. She's got a more in... significant role in the third one, hasn't she? Uh, yeah. Because that's... people shout about that a lot. I have a lot of opinions about Sofia Coppola in The Godfather Part 3. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait uh, for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Coppola just got all his family to be involved as well, which I think is pretty linked. Yeah, I love that. Neat. Um, this one I find really interesting. Mm-hmm. Sergio Leone, who is the director Good the of the... Good, uh, yep. Yeah. Was, a, was the original choice to, di- to direct the film. Mm. Uh, but he turned down the film since he felt the, the story which glorified the mafia was not interested enough. Uh, he later regretted refusing the offer. Yeah. However, he would go on to direct his own critically acclaimed gangster film, Once Upon a Time in America, which came out in 1984, which is one of my all-time favourite films as well. There you which go. I find, which that was the catalyst for doing Once Upon a Time in America because... He didn't want to do it because he was like, ah, but not doing The Godfather. I should do my own mob film. Yeah. Which I think, which I think is an underrated classic in this sense. We've already discussed that Sonny's death was inspired by Bonnie and Clyde. Mm-hmm. And the last little trivia, there's, by the way, there's loads of trivia on the INDB. I thought I was almost done and I wasn't even a third of the way through the trivia <laughs> for The Godfather. So if you're really that interested, go through it all. It's actually interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, after, after Michael does the assassination, the original planned an intermission, but director Francis Ford Coppola thought that would just slow down the pace of the film. Like the podcast. Yes, the intermission podcast. He was a fan. He was a fan. But I can see that, like, I can see that w- that would be a good place to have an intermission. Yeah. Like, right there. But I can understand his point. It would just be like, because at that point you're like, oh, okay, what now? And then imagine if intermission, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. And then and then once it gets back into it, like, oh, now Michael's in Sicily. And that could probably have more of an effect. It, it of, like, probably would have made it better for me. <laughs> like, I'd have probably enjoyed it more if there wasn't intermission. <laughs> I mean, you could, I mean, I sometimes do that with certain films. Like, I always, like, if I've seen it before, like yeah. especially long classic films, I'm like, this is round about the time where that would, yeah, like stop. So yeah. I'll my, my um the DVD that I have of the of uh, of Goodfellas is really fucking weird, right? It's a DVD that works like a vinyl. Oh, is it one of those double sided ones? Yeah. So you put oh, it it's in. Disgusting. It, it yeah. plays half the movie, yeah. right? Spoilers for Goodfellas, I guess. But it, it, it plays up to the bit where um, that dude gets shot in the foot. Mm. And then it just stops. Yeah. And then you have to take the disc out, flip it over, and put it back in again and play the second yeah. side. It's really weird. I, I've got uh, Ben Hur on DVD, and that's the same thing. Yeah. I haven't seen Ben Hur yet, but yeah. But I know with Godfather Part 2, my DVD, I don't have, I've got the Blu ray now, so it fits all on one disc. Yeah. But the DVD, because the Godfather's like, uh, the Godfather 2, I think it's three hours and 20 it's right, really yeah. long it's really long there's a point where it stops and a bit of music plays and then it goes uh put in disc two to continue <laughs> like, that's Jesus so weird Christ. so weird but yeah um yeah that was so yeah a lo- there's a few little tidbits on the godfather yeah there. there's our nice own, own opinions yeah. and also i want to uh just for a bit of a laugh, let me see if this is worth anything. Let me read. Let me try and find some negative reviews on Letterboxd, which is something that I like to do. Let's see how many I agree with. Yeah, which <laughs> I'm. But to be fair, I'm going direct uh, lowest rating, lowest first. So these are ha- So these are half star reviews for The Godfather, right? Okay. Um, I'm a big user of Letterboxd, mm-hmm. so I always do this casually. Anyway. Uh, okay, first one. Could have just started at a blank pe- Could have just stared at a blank piece of paper for the same effect. <laughs> if they were specifically talking about the bit with Sonny and Carlo, correct. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and like oh, make God. these worth something. <laughs> okay, right. Here's one. Um, I did not care for The Godfather. I just didn't care for it. I didn't like it. Everyone always says it's the perfect movie. What the fuck's this spelling? Robert De Niro. Yeah. Al, Al Pacino. Robert Duvall. They spelt Robert Duvall right. Oh, well, well done. 
Fine actors didn't like it. Robert De Niro isn't in it. It insit upon itself. I don't know what that means. What? But yeah, as you said, De Niro's not in this. <laughs> no, De Niro's not in this movie. <laughs> did you mean? What do they mean? Who did they think uh, was De Niro? Uh, maybe Brando. <laughs> I, was it Sonny? Did they think Robert De Niro was Sonny? I don't know. <laughs> That's really fucking stupid. Hang on, there's two comments. Did someone call them out on it? Oh, I hope so. Go on, go on. I want to make this person look like an idiot. Robert De Niro is not in this movie. <laughs> the person didn't respond to that. Right. And someone else put, I think you need to age 10 years and give this a rewatch. <laughs> <laughs> someone could probably say the same to me. <laughs> I think you need to age 10 years and watch it again. Oh, I had that about something. When I was 18, I reviewed an Italian film called The Great Beauty and I really disliked it. And then I got so much... Co- and then it, won <laughs> best foreign, then it won Best Foreign Language Film at the Oscars. The, the video got hundreds of views and then I got comments saying, you're too young to get it. <laughs> and I... Oh, cheers, thank you very much. Cheers, thank you for that. Uh, another one. Peter Griffin doesn't like this movie, so I don't. <laughs> what does that mean? Is that what? Is that That's like a... a reference to a Family Guy episode where Peter Griffin says he doesn't like The Godfather? Uh, maybe I don't know. <laughs> this fictional character doesn't like this movie. What is this review? What is this? I've just looked at this one. On. No, th- no thick Fortnite babes or Ugandan knuckle dance. Sad face. <laughs> what? <laughs> what an absolute meme lord! Uh, that is incredible right. stuff. Well done. Uh, another one, half a star. The review is fell asleep. Just that's Brilliant. it. Just that, that's exactly asleep. what Julia would say. <laughs> another one. It's really long. I don't know. Me? Was that me? Look at the name. Was it Robbie Sweetnail? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. Right, half a star. Mustaches weren't nice enough. <laughs> Who has a mustache in this movie? Marlon Brando does. Uh, the bloke who he was talking to at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, but they've got pretty nice... They're like little pencil I know, mustaches. Yeah. <laughs> they're nice, like nice little cute pencil ones. Better than mine. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you're doing better than me. I think that's all the mustaches I can think of. What were they? <laughs> they saw yeah, the no. opening scene. They saw the opening scene and they were like, what's this mustache game? I was like, am I having a weird Mandela effect thing where I can't remember Pacino having a mustache? But he didn't, he didn't have a mustache in this movie, did he? No, he definitely like, I'm not did not just have an a idiot. No, you're not. No. Okay. <laughs> um, one of them was orange peel. So, <laughs> and as we've learned, stay away God. from the oranges. Just stay away from them. Um, if it wasn't a how you say paradigm shift in cinema, I would mm. give it a how you say zero astaza. <laughs> Is he making fun of the fact that everyone's Italian? Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> Wait, hang on, hang on. What the fuck's this review? <laughs> Zero right. stars, yeah. I'm, I'm watching. I'm going. I'm only reading the the next two because that's the first page done, and I'm not going any further into that. Okay. Um, watched online with no subtitles. Speak English. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, me. That's, your, that's me again. I, I mean, that's no. That's your own fault. Why are you? No, you you just so you watched it online with no subtitles. What are you gonna get out? of that? I mean, I was, uh, me and my dad's version didn't have any subtitles on for the bit where they were talking Italian. That's not, do you mean in the restaurant? In in the restaurant, it didn't have subtitles. So I, I didn't yeah. know what was happening in the restaurant. Yeah, that, that that's just not in the film because apparently, another bit of trivia, they were speaking Italian too fast. Oh, brilliant. So. <laughs> but, there was that, but then like the, the bit um, where he's like, I'm going to take your wife or whatever. I, I'm going to take your daughter. Yeah. Like that bit didn't have any subtitles on. We had to turn them on and rewind it because we had no I mean, idea what did, the fuck was happening. <laughs> but I mean, you did uh, wait. Well, that's all. Yeah, because that has subtitles. That's yeah. weird. Like, and, then we, and then we just kept subtitles on for the rest of the movie, which was good for when Brando came on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said, "Look right. how they massacred my boy." I guess. <laughs> okay. Right. The last half a star review I'm reading on Letterboxd here for The Godfather. Go on. Uh, the Godfather, more like the Bore Father, because I was bored to death watching this shit. Pre proto, pre proto soy cinema, it insists upon itself. I don't know what that means. 
eloquently put. Well done, my sir. <laughs> lovely. Exceptional. Uh, absolutely lovely. Right. <laughs> Fucking hell. So that's some half a star reviews of The Godfather on Letterboxd. Um, I kind of want to do this for all the films that we do it on our pure oh, curiosity. 100%. Because it's so, because, you know, <laughs> it's a bit of a laugh. Because, isn't it? because morons exist and it's funny to laugh at them. Well, it's also because it's like, there's a, right, I could just read other positive reviews, but everyone knows that, they, you know, it's The Godfather. I don't yeah. need to read, and we've just been talking positive about it, but with, with other bits and pieces in there yeah but you know i like to read you know that robert de Niro <laughs> was real bad in it apparently <laughs> was in it and the mustaches were nice enough <laughs> <laughs> so fucking dumb <laughs> i love you letterboxd never change um, i love him <laughs> uh but yeah what i want to lead on to is episode two robbie yes this. okay I had something in mind Go on. for the next film. I kind of want it right. I thought of like two different ways we can take this and I'm going to let you choose which way we can probably take this. Go on. I'm so ready. We could eat. I want to stick with a bit of a theme. We can either go with 70s Pacino mm-hmm. or 70s Coppola. We okay. can do them. We can do them both at a certain point, but which, but so if we go to seven, because to me personally, I think Coppola had, as a director, had the best seventies, okay. and as an actor, I personally think Pacino had the best seventies as an actor. Mm-hmm. So I think it might, I, and I'm interested of in what your thoughts are on each of those films. Anyway, I'm going to list you the films cool. of what for Pacino in 1970. So this was 1972. Mm-hmm. In 73, in 73, Pacino did Serpico, which I briefly talked told you about yes uh then in 1974 he did the godfather cool. part two yeah and then in 75 he did another film called dog day afternoon which was also with the same director who did serpico mm-hmm. and also has john Cazale in it um in dog day afternoon Very nice. in terms of 70s coppola mm-hmm. what he did after the godfather he in 1974 he did two films he did the godfather part two mm-hmm. but he also did a film called The Conversation, which is kind of like a bit of a New York espionage type of film with Gene Hackman, which cool. is e- excellent. I really, It gets overshadowed because it came out the exact same year as The Godfather 2, but I think both of them are absolutely excellent. Right. Then, he did the, then he did The Godfather 2, then he did Apocalypse Now in 1979. Okay. I'd probably, I'd probably go with the Coppola ones. Okay. Because... They seem like movies I need to see properly, I'm, and I'm sure I do need to see the Pacino ones. Well, I, haven't no, seen, I haven't seen any of those. <laughs> an, an Apocalypse Now is definitely a movie that I need to see. Dude, that's a the theatrical cut. That's the film you need. That's the version okay. you need to watch first. I have it on DVD. I don't know which cut I have, but I have a you, cut of it on DVD. You would probably have the um, theatrical. Yeah, I'd that one so. is. That one is, I think, about two and a half hours. Okay. Because what's interesting with that film, they did a. The theatrical cut was two and a half hours. Then the Redux cut was mm-hmm. two hours. And then the extended cut, which came out last year, which I got to see in IMAX, yeah. uh, w- was three hours. So it's. Oh. You know, but I think. No, am I wrong? No, the Redux. I'm completely wrong. The Redux cut is three and a half hours. Jesus Christ. But the extended, but no, it's the final cut, not the extended cut. I said it all wrong. But, it's um, all right, mate. It's been a long day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So there, that's what that is. Right. So, okay. But so, if that's the case, Robbie, let me look it up to see if it's anywhere. I would propose having a bit of a, in terms of these episodes, mm-hmm. make Godfather Two, Episode Three. Okay. And make the conversation ep- the next one. Okay. I will watch the conversation. Uh, and I can tell you where to watch that at some other after we come off. Sorry. Because that, that's not I've got a lot of movies to watch at the minute, you know. Because I've got to watch conversation for this. I've got like five Seth Rogen movies to watch for me and Leo's podcast. Mm. <laughs> so that's going to be great. <laughs> like, that's, that's what I kind of want to do with this. Because I like... 
You know, I love, again, I like just talking general film, but I also love talking older acclaimed yeah. films and stuff. And again, I'm interested in your thoughts as either being new to mm-hmm. it or even there might be some films that, like, for example, American Graffiti, you're going to be the one who's going to be... Push him, because I, I like that movie. Oh, good. And, and, it, and, it, and it would be the first one that I would have seen, and it would be the first time that I yeah, see yeah. that film. So like, I, you know, I, I kind of like that dynamic good of shit. it all, of doing that. Because I like, because again, do 70s Coppola, and then after we do that, then we can do the Serpico and Dog Day mm-hmm. Afternoon in terms of 70s Pacino, because that's... Oh, that's good. That's good stuff Sounds as good. well. But to start to wrap things up, I want to um, throw out there uh, a brief promotion of. Uh, I again, I don't usually promote my own stuff, but this podcast is a bit different. Um, you can follow. Uh, I would say you can follow me on Letterboxd. Links would be in the mm-hmm. description of wherever this is: Spotify, YouTube, Apple, wherever yes. it is. There will be a description. Letterbox. That I I have a Twitter and Instagram, but it's completely irrelevant to what <laughs> this is. But if you want to see if you want to see some daft reviews that I've done or lists or something or my film diary, go on Letterboxd. Find me on Letterboxd. Uh, it's if you just go letterboxd.com slash fitchit, I'm there. And um, again, it's completely irrelevant to follow me on Twitter because what do I even do on there? <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, is there any is there anything that you, Robbie, want to promote about um, yourself? There, I will plug. Uh, I would say I'll plug my Instagram. It's Robbie uh, uh, at Robbie underscore Tweed. Um, follow me on there because most of my promotion stuff for the podcasts and just generally things that I do is on there. So you know, if you want to keep up to date with when a when a new episode of this podcast will be out, or a new pod uh, a new episode of my podcast, or a new episode of the other podcast that I have with my friend leo they're all all of the updates are on there so if you want you know if you want to stay in stay in touch with that instagram is the place to be for me that's another thing i'll throw that out there we're not we don't just do these select pieces of content um if you want to see another podcast that i host uh that robbie's been a part of he was on episode two uh the the and we're rolling podcast is also again links everything will be in description that's where you can find all of that that's a podcast where unlike this it's completely late i mean this is laid yeah. back but unlike this podcast amber roll is i get someone on and we just chat no structure just go for it and also you can also follow you can also go to to see films of mine the newest film uh branch that i've got is rnq films again links will be in there i've got one short film on there called threads where i did a post-rock music video a few months ago go and check that out and that's all i can think of about what i'm doing at the minute um uh, all the time our media stuff you can find in the description below again the time our website the time of twitter instagram go for that and robbie's got a podcast in his own uh again the individual's podcast there which i'll throw that there and then when when me and leo's podcast starts to be put up we can put links to that as well uh whenever that'll be yeah let me know when you've got that and i can throw it in there but that's the uh but i also want to say something throw this out there i don't know when this episode would get uploaded but either way what i'm about to say is it will always be relevant and all. I just want to say, because I haven't had a chance to discuss this in a public manner and sense as well about the whole Black Lives mm-hmm. Matter thing. I'm not going to get in a full tangent. What I will simply say is I'm leaving links in the description as well for things to donate and sign petitions and stuff because I do think it's a very important cause that uh, needs to really truly be looked into. And just what I will say is also educate yourselves. Just always keep educated and because that's where I didn't do it for a while, I didn't talk about it because my thought was like, oh, I don't know anything yeah. about it, so I should, I, I, I don't have a place to talk about it. You need that's the problem. People need to start having those conversations. Educate, ha- start. They need to start having those thoughts and those understandings. So again, links with articles and petitions and donations will also be in the description below, and just keep sharing, keep supporting, and. Just, yeah, just keep on with all of that. stuff. And also another bit of promotion that's not uh, at all um, 
as serious as this, but considering we are a podcast, the Intermission Podcast, uh, celebration of cinema. Mm-hmm. No, Siri. <laughs> no. <laughs> Go away. A, celebra- a celebration of cinema. I'm also going to leave, support your independent cinemas, especially at this time period of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. There's a lot of cinemas that are heavily in danger of not being able to be reopened again. Yeah. And I talked about it on uh, episode zero of Amber Rowland, but I would like to make this podcast a good platform for that to constantly say support your independent cinema uh for me specifically it's the um tyneside cinema but whatever cinema that you love that isn't a cine world or an odeon or review or wherever just support it i know tyneside has got some donations i also know tyneside's got membership things to like if you sign up to tyneside you can get exclusive things off Mubi and curzon home cinema so you can still contribute to cinema even when they're not open so that's why i promote the people as well even though you can't go to cinemas at the moment look into how you can help so that's all i'll simply say so um, I don't know when exactly this will be. I don't know if this would be a weekly show. I would want to try and make this a bit of a semi-regular yeah. thing. I mean, it's easier to make this one a regular thing. Yeah, definitely. Should we say weekly? We can have a, we can have a go with weekly, yeah. If we get a bit burnt out, we can make a bi-weekly. <laughs> but, should we, but should we say whenever this gets uploaded, because I'm still waiting for the theme song for Lewis, you've heard it if you've if you, you you know what I'm it is. So excited to hear when, it. I'm, I'm so excited. But, but whenever but whenever I get that from Lewis, that's when uh that'll be up. So next week, whenever next week is, episode two of the Intermission Podcast will be us talking about Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation. Sounds good. Which would be the second time I've seen the film and the first time Robbie's yes. seen it. Which I'm interested. And until then, everyone, keep safe, keep educated, and just keep watching solid yeah. films. Keep safe, keep educated, and stay away from oranges. That's my final thought. God, God damn those oranges. Fucking oranges. God damn them. <laughs> Till next time, see you later, everyone, and bye bye. See you soon.